Welcome everyone to the Future of SEO seminar. I'm very happy you've been, you're here. I'm excited to share with you the data that we've got. Uh, we've got a variety of experts coming as well who are going to come and share their insights. And frankly, welcome everyone to the Future of SEO seminar. I'm very happy you've been, you're here. I'm excited to share with you the data that we've got. Uh, we've got a variety of experts coming as well who are going to come and share their insights. And frankly, I don't know that we're going to be able to get through everything in the four hours that we have. So I'm just going to go as long as I can. And uh, I'm just very thankful that you're here. I'm thankful for your support, for your questions. I'm going to try and answer as many of them as I can. And as we go through here, uh, if you have questions, just drop them in the chat. And I may not see them like immediately, but what I will do is I'll try to go through uh, the presentations during some of the pre-recorded portions. And those sections will be obvious. You'll know when like it's a pre-recorded thing because uh, it'll look like this. I think reports are the biggest BS that SEO agencies sell to clients. And here's why, hear me out. I can massage data all day long. I can give you a report that makes you look amazing online. I can bring thousands of new visitors to your pages every single day, easy. But it doesn't matter because what matters is, are you getting those good potential new client calls? Are you getting the conversions? The only report you need is the amount of calls you've gotten that month. And is it coming from SEO? And is it more or less than you've gotten the month before? Data in itself, completely useless, especially in a world that is completely inundated with data. And I can go to chat GPT and have it create me something lovely. Um, I think it's a waste of time and I think it's a waste of energy. I think if you need a report to know if your SEO is working, then your SEO is not working. That's it. Housekeeping matters. Number one is that there's no CLE credit for this seminar. It's really foundationally on marketing. And so the state bar is not going to approve that. Uh, number two is that uh, I strongly recommend that you be in front of a computer for this presentation. There's I'm going to break every rule of good presenting because there's just like mountains and mountains and mountains of text. Uh, and there's no real good way for me to get rid of that. So you're going to see lots of text uh, on a lot of the slides. And if you're watching on a phone or you've got like a small screen or you're even just like kind of watching passively in the background, I strongly recommend that you get in front of a computer, put it, you know, to full screen so that you can see the text that is on the screen. And you can also so you can better understand what we're talking about and see the data that I'm presenting. And if you do that at the end of the day, what you're going to be left with is number one, you're going to be given a methodology for you to determine whether the company or your in-house team that's doing the marketing for your website does a good job or might need some tweaking, you're going to get a methodology to interview and work through hiring a good SEO for your company. And then finally, you're going to get some tools to use ChatGPT or at least understand the process of using some of these generative text tools to create blog posts or marketing plans so that you can either do it yourself or that you or you can provide better oversight for people who are doing it for you. Uh, and so the first thing I wanted to start with is a clip from our roundtable of BS things that these professionals are seeing in the market. You know, I've seen a lot of BS in this industry, no doubt, but I think it really comes down practically to the strategy and the overall approach that a client is buying. If you're buying an approach and, and the vendor is, has basically laid out a full game plan, they're, they're specifying here, we're gonna do X amount of this, blog articles, for example, X amount of this, X amount of that. I, not to suggest that there are no groups out there getting not getting results, but from our experience, if you're anticipating that you need to do X amount of this, X amount of that, six months down the road, seven, eight months down the road, um, you are not positioning yourself to be agile and to be able to evolve as the market evolves. Uh, there are always going to be evolutions and in, in rankings and how your site ranks for this or that. And you want an SEO that will adapt 
to the market itself as new competitors come on. So that, that would be my biggest challenge to a group that has what I would consider much more of a cookie cutter month to month rinse and repeat approach. Before we go any further, I want to give you the most important thing to know, because uh, I'm 100 percent certain that there are going to be people who are watching this and you're going to say that was wrong. This guy doesn't know what he's talking about. And I want to own this from the beginning. I am not a SEO expert. I'm not a marketing expert. I'm barely a legal expert. And all I'm trying to do is offer you unbiased, disinterested, objective advice and data for you to make your own decisions about your marketing. I'm not going to recommend to you a single marketing company during this presentation. Anyone that you see here, I asked to be here to give you advice. I'm not sponsored. There's no nothing uh, that here that other than me trying to do the best that I can to help other lawyers make informed decisions with their marketing dollars. And to get started with this, though, is that I still got to dig at least a little bit into the very basics of SEO, and we'll cover some core concepts that will be necessary to understand some of this later stuff. And if you are a marketing expert and you are looking at this and you're saying, hey, he's just getting it wrong, leave a comment. Uh, like, help correct this, help everyone, you know, help everyone get on the same page. And I'll call it out and as, as we go along here if I see it, uh, because... I am not an SEO expert. I'm just a guy who really enjoys going through the data. So number, number one is the core principle of search engine optimization that you have to know. And that is this. If you're not first, you're last. And the reason why is because you can spend as much money as you want to on SEO. And if you're not able to attract a single client because you're not on the first page of Google for that competitive keyword that you're wanting to go after, Every dollar you spent is wasted. Like, I can't tell you how many lawyers have called and told me I spent 80, 90, 100, $200,000 a year on SEO and I don't have a single client to show for it. And that's because they did not rank on the first page for a competitive, and we'll talk about what's competitive and not competitive, keyword that is actually getting traffic and has people that are there and clicking on it and going to their website. Because if you're not on the first page, the odds are they will never see your website. So the question then becomes like, how do you get to be first? Like, what does it take? And it's really more simple than people are willing to admit. And that's because it all comes down to three things. The quality of the content that you're putting on there is if you have the highest quality content and it doesn't matter if you do all the other technical stuff right you're going to rank above someone else who doesn't have quality content. And if they both have reasonably high quality content, then Google's going to fall back to proximity, like who's searching that's closer. And then the next thing they're going to look at, if you're both like reasonably far away, is they're going to look at relevance. How many backlinks or other news stories or websites are linking to your website to say that like uh, between these two, this is the one that we need to be highlighting and putting in front of people. And a lot of times there's no competition for a keyword whatsoever. As we're going to go look through this data today, most keywords don't really have, you know, any difficulty in ranking for them. And so your standard for quality can be low. Like here's an example of what we're doing. So we're the, we're the only game in town in the entire country for car mobilization, car booting. And we're the top of the top of the map. We're nine out of the 10 top 10 results. And the 10 of the 10 is probably news articles about our cases. But the reality is that that's a keyword that nobody wants. Like we're the only people who want that keyword. And by simply putting on our website, we want booting cases. That was enough for Google to go, good for me. You can have them because no one else wanted them. And that's going to be the same thing that's applying to a lot of other practice areas as we see when we go through here. And I don't want you to discount the niche practice area because we're going to talk a lot about like the most difficult keywords, but also the easiest keywords are sometimes the best. And the reason why is because when you're the only game in town and you're on that niche topic and when the media comes knocking and wants to do a story about it, you're the only person, you're the local expert on that topic. And then you're the you one. Park your car at a lot in Atlanta, walk off the property, come back and your car's going to be. 
Since 2012, we've helped at least 500,000 people who have been wounded in Georgia. And Atlanta counts for the lion's share of that. So when the media comes knocking, you're the only game in town. And so we were able to get the call when they were doing a national story on car booting and our traffic, and this is our traffic for that day. This is early, this is like two weeks ago. Uh, and our traffic doubled just from that news story on a keyword, on a, a practice area that generally was getting very low traffic uh, overall. Uh, the good news for us, though, is that 99% of the people who do search for that are looking for a lawyer and are ready to hire somebody. And so, like, don't discount the niches, but then also don't get confused about like what you're really focusing on for the most part. And that is like the big keywords. When we're talking about the difference between this one was 30 a month. So this is a keyword. This is Kratom. So this is something that we're now doing wrongful death cases involving Kratom. Now ranking for Kratom as it has a 66 difficulty and there, but there's 52,000 people who are searching about Kratom and whether it's dangerous, whether it can kill you. And so like, just by putting on our webpage, hey, we do Kratom is like not gonna get it done. So like right this second, and we, we have the lion's share of Kratom wrongful death cases in the United States, and we're still not relevant according to Google. We're ranking number 33 for Kratom wrongful death over a variety of government websites because those government websites are going to trump us every day. And the reason why is because they have more backlinks. They have more relevance in the eyes of Google in terms of credibility. And then generally speaking, you're going to lose the proximity battle too, unless someone is reasonably close to where you are. Like someone in Michigan or California is probably not going to get our page over a government website nine times out of 10. And for difficult keywords, it can be almost impossible to crack into that first page if you don't have a very concentrated effort. So here is the uh, two year look back for Car Accident Lawyer Atlanta. And each of these lines represents a law firm uh, domain. And watch what happens over the past two years. Practically nothing, like nine out of the 10 law firms kept their spot in the top 10 uh, at the end of the day, let's see who came up. Uh, Atlanta Injury Lawyer came up near the end here. Uh, but otherwise, John Foy, Darren Tobin, Gary Martin Hayes, Ken Nugent, uh, Mike Rafey, John Hasner, uh, Bader Scott, like those guys are at the top, on the top, in the top 10, and they've stayed there for two years despite every other lawyer in Atlanta who wants to do car wreck cases doing everything they can to knock them off of the top. So the first question that you've got to ask is if you're considering hiring an SEO company or you're trying to figure out like whether you guys are doing it right or not is what are we going after and how hard is it? Because if you're going after car accident lawyer, your budget needs to be sky high. But if you're going after booting cases, you probably don't even need a marketing company at all. So there are a couple of different websites that you can go to to look at the keywords like you can type in like divorce lawyer or criminal lawyer or immigration lawyer and you most of these are free uh, i use a refs which i'll put my head here i use a refs as my primary tool and you can go in and look and see like do you have a niche practice and even if you don't have a niche practice look at your local competition because there may not be anyone else in your area that is interested in that search term or is doing that area, or is at least not online doing it. And I made this easy for you. Most of our people here are from Georgia. So uh, one of the data points that I pulled was the keyword difficulty for terms in Georgia. So these are the practice areas. Let me get out of the way here. Doop, doop, doop. Bling, bling, bling. There we go. So personal injury lawyer, Atlanta, 56 difficulty. All the way down at Chapter 7 Attorney Atlanta, zero. So if you are a bankruptcy attorney, excuse me, a Chapter 7 attorney, and you just throw up on your website, I want Chapter 7 cases, you might rank in very short order. And the same thing is true for something like Slip and Fall Lawyers Atlanta, 
Like there are a lot of people who do premises cases, but no one is going after that term. And so that's something that you can look at and say like, well, do we want to go after that? And the thing that you want to look at to determine that is volume. So just because a keyword is easy and sounds good doesn't mean that you're going to want it. So volume is the other metric that goes along with keyword difficulty. You want to find a keyword that has a reasonable difficulty and a high volume or even better, a keyword that has no difficulty and extremely high volume. So personal injuries, lawyers, Atlanta, Georgia, personal injury, law, Georgia. These are all very difficult keywords or relatively difficult, but they also have low volume. So even if you're going after the quote big game, you want to make sure you're going after the right game. And this is the difference between personal injury lawyer Atlanta and personal injury law Georgia. The person who wins personal injury lawyer Atlanta is going to get 2,600 traffic every month. You win the game on personal injury law Georgia, you get 10. And people are going to, and I'm, I'm certain that the people in the comments are saying like this, this is probably not right. And, and maybe it's not for volume because that does seem low. But the point is that you want to go and run your keywords and compare the difficulty to the volume in deciding like where are you going to make your stand? Where are you going to spend your dollars? And even if they are sending you this pretty report every month that says, hi, we got you to number the top 10 on these 45 keywords, the very next thing out of your mouth needs to be cool. Give me the volume report for these terms that you've ranked me for. Like how many people are searching for? What's the market that I can actually be going after for that? And keyword research itself is kind of an art and science. Like I did the best that I could with this, uh, but there are a lot of tools out there. Most of them are free. And I can't tell you how many times I've had SEO companies call me and be like, hi, I got Dave Smith number one as the business lawyer in Atlanta or the real estate attorney in Atlanta. And then you go and look at and that sounds impressive. But then you go and look at the difficulty and the volume and you go, no one's searching for that. And so don't get tricked by vanity metrics. Like we're all familiar with vanity metrics like uh, impressions, but don't be tricked by the vanity metrics of keywords that have no volume uh, or even worse, chasing after high difficulty keywords without a sufficient budget and without having a tactical plan to do it. Because if you're going to go after 50 or a 40 or even a 90 difficulty word, you've got to have a, a tactical play in place to go and look at it. And here's the reason why. So a couple of years, or excuse me, not a couple of months ago, the uh, source code of Yandex allegedly uh, was leaked. And Yandex is the Russian search equivalent of Google. And in there was thousands of algorithmic evaluation things for uh, ranking on Yandex. And Yandex is largely thought to be kind of a knockoff of Google. And so in there is a lot of things that no one really knows what it means. Like the, the document is selection from TikTok. Like, so it sounds like TikTok is a thing that people care about. The ratio of dwell time on a host in a given region to dwell time on a host in all regions. So like they're looking at things like how long are people saying on this and similar websites? Do you have the you did you add this page to a bookmark like Yandex is tra it was tracking that and determined that that was a ranking factor. Like these are things that are just hard to control for the Levenstein distance between the query and the URL of the form uh, for a YouTube video. Like I don't know what that means. And I, I, I would challenge someone uh, you know, to explain what that is with any kind of clarity. Uh, so let's keep going through these. And as you kind of go through here, you can just Google like the Yandex search uh, key, uh, excuse me, search algorithms, and you can find this list online. Uh, but it does, it's not going to do anything for you. And the reason it's not going to do anything for you is because Almost all of this stuff is things that are outside of your control. And that's kind of the point I want to drive home is that no one really knows how Google is evaluating 
your website and your ranking. But what we do know is that higher quality content that is closer to the individual with a sufficient number of backlinks will almost always beat out the other people because all of these kinds of metrics will support that. So like the share of incoming traffic or the percentage of visits that, that stay there for longer than 90 or 160 seconds, the people are staying for 90 or 166 seconds, 160 seconds because the quality is higher. Uh, so like you can try and game that, but that's not necessarily going to help you in the long term. Uh, so as you're trying to evaluate like, where's your website, one thing that you can look at is this thing called domain authority. So instead of going and tracking down like all of your uh, your backlinks and your location to searches and all that kind of stuff, one of the like kind of like quick and easy ways to determine like where do I stand is your domain authority. And there are a couple of different domain authority metrics. Uh, you can hear things like a UL number or domain authority. Uh, I think SEMrush has their own number. They're all pretty similar to each other. And like Wikipedia would have a 100 domain rating or Adobe or the National Institute of Health. Those are going to be 100 uh, domain rating websites. So this is our two year look back on our domain rating for wfirm.com. So we started at a nine and nine is actually pretty average for a normal personal injury law firm. And the problem those that were in Atlanta, which is incredibly competitive with lots of people doing really good SEO work. So we had to work really hard to like make progress on all of those factors. And those are factors and that's reflected in our domain rating, which is now at 56. And if you signed up uh, early enough for this seminar, I emailed you your domain rating like you should have that in your inbox and uh and so just go look for that email and if you don't have it you know shoot me an email or even better you can go to a refs and it's a h w r e f s dot com a h w e r f oh boy i'm gonna just put it up on a graphic here uh but you can go there and enter in your website for free um, and it'll tell you your domain rating, domain rating right there. And in addition to giving you your domain rating, it will also give you the backlinks. These are the websites that link to your web page. So you can go through there and see the, the, the quantity and the quality of the backlinks that you have. Like this is saying that we have around 6,000 backlinks. A lot of them seem to have something to do with tires. So if I'm trying to evaluate like what is, how is Google seeing my website? The answer is that they are going that it sees that we do a lot of product liability work involving defective tires. My message about Kratom is not getting out there the same way. So AREFs is a is a tool that you can then use to like dig deeper to get past that like initial like couple of websites uh, backlinks. And I strongly recommend that you get a subscription to AREFs because it's a very small investment to have an incredible amount of information about your domain, about your website, the work that's being done. And I do recommend that you get a subscription to AREFs, even at the $99 a month level, you get a ton of tools. I'm not going to go into all of them and I'm going to try and stay focused on backlinks, but you can monitor like the overall health of your website. And it's a really cool tool for just figuring out what's going on on your website and whether you're keeping pace with other firms that are ranking for the terms that you do want to rank for, as well as for figuring out what you want to rank for in the first place. So I'll go into our site here. So I'm able to check our backlinks or referring domains over time. So I'm able to see that we had 239 referring domains two years ago. Now we've got 1200. Uh, there are a lot of firms that have a whole lot more than that, but I'm happy with that progress. I can also track our domain rating over time. Uh, and see that like I'm getting steady progress. And this is one of those things that you do want to keep an eye on, if only because once you're plateauing, you can have a conversation with your company or look at what you're doing to say, like, what can we do to keep getting that upward momentum? And I can go even drill down in like the individual backlinks over time and just look at what am I getting? What's the frequency? Or I can drill in and say, like, for example, right now we're really interested in wrongful death cases involving Kratom. So I can drill down and say, for example, I want to see what backlinks are being generated uh, or what media articles are being done related to our Kratom efforts. 
uh, and go in and see, you know, what's going on. Uh, like if I've done like a, a media uh, push with an agency and like they didn't link to our website, I can go in here and kind of monitor and make sure that like the, the link did come in. If not, I can call them and say, hey, can you put a link to our website on that article that you did? Um, so it's a very powerful tool for checking your backlinks. Uh, and you absolutely should get a subscription to it because there's just a whole lot more here. And we'll go through a little bit of it later. Uh, but there's a there's a lot of tools here. But the backlinks to me, AREFs is number one for tracking those as well as doing like research on like what who is linking to other people's websites. And in addition to your backlinks, like once you've kind of got like a good foundation, like, hey, we've got a lot of backlinks or we've got as many backlinks as the other firms that are ranking higher than us, then you can start drilling down onto the more technical stuff. And we're talking about things like, you know, your your schematics, excuse me. You can drill down into the more technical stuff, like the schema on your website. And I'm talking about like your header tags and your images and alt tags, the length of your content and optimizing that, your overall page structure, your linking strategy, those kinds of things. And these are all like slightly more technical terms. So what I wanted to do for this section is to bring on Eric Warnaki and his team from Omnizan to kind of talk through some of those issues. Uh, Omnizan is currently my SEO company, but I'm not bringing them on here as an endorsement. Like we very recently hired them and you can kind of judge for yourself whether they're doing a good job just by monitoring our website over the next couple of months. And if you see, you know, us getting improvement and things, you know, continuing to go on an upward trend, then like they're doing a good job. And if not, don't hire them. Uh, and, and so either way, I'm going to bring on Eric and let's kind of walk through some of this more technical stuff. You know, working with you thus far has been an absolute pleasure. I was thrilled to hear that you invited us to participate on this platform today. Uh, to cannot be true. To There's practice. no plan for that is true. <laughs> yeah. And my name is uh, Eric Warnicke, and I'm the uh, technical SEO lead at Omnizen. And so I'm excited here to just look at some websites, look at some data and figure out, you know, what advice we can give to uh, other attorneys out there to be able to them, you know, allow them to have more control over their marketing and the future success of their company. Um, so that's uh, really, I'm excited to have this opportunity to to share a lot of stuff that I know today with everybody. So thank you, man. So we can do this kind of one of two ways. Uh, so when people registered for the seminar, some they said, hey, you know, either A, I want you to look at my website and kind of tell me what your thoughts, or two, they said, I don't necessarily want you to, but if you need to, you can go and look at our website. So we can either jump into the websites and start looking at the issues, or we can kind of go through what I call like the low hanging fruit first and then go to websites. Kind of what's the approach that you think is best for this? Yeah. Uh, so to me, I think it might uh, be be helpful really to just start uh, doing a couple audits there and, and getting a look at uh, some of the the specifics of, uh, you know, SEO strategy and are things being done well or not, and then kind of use that to bridge into uh, the over, you know, the overarching data that you collected in the bigger picture. Okay. Then uh, what I'll do is I'll bring up, let's see. I'll bring up the first website, which is uh, AFJ Law Firm, and let me, let me pull that, and I'll put it up on the screen here. And this is a Bozeman, uh, and I'm just reading the page here for the first time. So this is a Bozeman, uh, Montana pers personal injury firm. So I can make it bigger for you. There you go. Um, so kind of just right off the bat, like what are you, when you're assessing a website or let's just say that like, and I don't mean this from a technical SEO perspective. Like if I'm a person who is like an attorney trying to figure out like, how do I assess whether like my website is, is doing the stuff it's supposed to do? Like what are kind of the first things that I'm looking at? Yeah. I mean, so just from a visual point, you know, what you want to make sure is that the expertise of the attorney uh, or attorneys really the whole firm itself is, is on display here. And so when you look at this, you know, the first thing you really see is, is those Rocky mountains uh, there. And we see, um, you know, that it is a Montana personal injury and insurance law firm. Right. But I feel that uh, this website would be better, you know, served if uh, the attorney itself was uh, featured a little bit more prominently. 
it's good that we have these uh, victories right there up front, but I don't think immediately that uh, the expertise of this attorney is uh, is coming across uh, obviously enough to me right away. That's my first thought. So one of the things we talked about was like header tags. And like here I've got, I see make your voice heard. And then I see Montana personal injury and insurance law. Uh, talk to me a little bit about these two, the both, you know, the heading that they're choosing as well as the order in which they're in. And, and one of the things that we can do yeah. is I'll pull, and this is the AREFS toolbar. So this one has a H1 of make your voice heard. So can you kind of reiterate number one, what is an H1? What is the importance of it? Yeah, so this is uh, called a heading tag. And really it's in the order um, of importance. And so an H1 is equivalent maybe to the, uh, you know, the title of your book, you know, and then the H2 tags would be the equivalent of each chapter. Maybe H3 would be the equivalent of sort of a subsection within it, right? And so you want to make sure that there's only one H1 tag on each page of your site. And you want to make sure that that H1 tag contains the keywords that you want your website to be able to rank for. And so you can see right here front and center, this H1 tag is that one that says make your voice heard. Uh, in my opinion, that's not a good um, H1 tag for this website. And in fact, just below that, they have an H5 tag, which we mentioned sort of the order of importance. You know what I mean? It goes down all the way down to H6, from H1 all the way down to H6, with the importance, you know, being in with the H1s and the H2s. With this being an H5 like that, saying Montana personal injury and insurance law, he's effectively getting almost no SEO value out of that. It's, it's nearly the same thing as if that was a normal, you know, paragraph tag. And so I would really swap this if it were me. I would have his H1 say Montana personally injury, you know, and insurance law, and then have the thing that says uh, make your voice heard, maybe just have that be an H5 or make that just a strong uh, tag right there because that's more of sort of a tagline and, and won't necessarily help them with rankings at all. So that's the first thing I would do here. So it seems, and I'm just looking at this. So it seems like just with almost no effort, it seems like all you would have to do is say, this is my H1, make this an H5 because it doesn't actually tell you anything about what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And then make each of these either H2 or H3s to let people know that these are the important practice areas that we're doing. Uh, and then, you know, maybe not even have these H6s, uh, you know, make everything a higher, higher up on the hierarchy. I mean, is that a fair statement of something that they could do today with literally no effort? Extremely fair. Uh, it would take three seconds. And the other thing about this is, you know, you want these to basically be in, in a sensible order too. So you want your H1 at the very top, right? followed by an H2, maybe an H3, right? Then another H2, another H3. But we've got this sort of strangeness here, with H1, H5, H2, H5. I think they're over <clears throat> relying on these H5 tags uh, and they shouldn't be used in this way. Um, it, they're just being overused. Got it. Okay, so then the other thing that I noticed when I pulled this up here, uh, so actually I'm gonna throw this up here Mm -hmm. uh, so, cause we talked about how many, can I have multiple H ones tags on a page? Is that appropriate? So there's a little bit of a, a, a controversy, different schools of thoughts on this. Um, I'll, I'll keep it simple. There should be one H one on each page. Now the caveat from that has to do with the old version of HTML, HTML four versus the new version of HTML, what they call HTML five. Traditionally in HTML four, you would only ever have one H1 tag. The, the new guideline says that it's okay if you have multiple sections on a page and you have one H1 in each section. However, I still disregard that advice and I only have one H1 regardless of whether it's HTML5, regardless if I have a hundred different sections. I'm always gonna have one H1 at the top and then every subsection is gonna be an H2. So that's, uh, that's, that's the information right there. Okay. So as I go back up to my page, here, let me pull it back up. And again, I'm using just the AREFS toolbar that you can get, it's free. Mm -hmm. And what I see here is a meta tag. Uh, tell me what that is and what it's important is. Yeah, so that right there specifically is a title tag. And what the title tag's main purpose is, uh, is for search engines like Google, 
to be able to get a quick idea of what the page is about. And so there's two things that are the most important on a page as far as telling Google, well, let's say three things, right? Uh, that are important as far as Google being able to know what the page is about. Number one is the URL itself, right? In this case, you know, AFJ law firm. Number two is that H1. And then uh, number three is the page title. And so Google will actually scrape that page title and show it in the Google search engine results page when you do a search. So let's say you did a search for Montana personal injury lawyer, right? At some point, AFJ is going to appear on that Google search engine result page. And in that little listing that you'll see on Google, you'll see the page title. And then below that, you'll see their meta description, which is a one or two sentence description of the page. And then, of course, just the link to be able to get there. Uh, so if you could, uh, Matt, if you have the ability to open up another tab, just do a quick search in Google for Montana personal injury uh, attorney or that. That's just fine. I'll do, the, I'll do this H5. Yeah, let's do that exact match. So you can see they actually pop up there. Well, probably uh, they pop up number one, probably because they're the only person that has that exact um, H5 right there uh, with, you know, personal injury and insurance law in there. No, that's not them. This oh, sorry. I, uh, I, I saw We're that. looking for AFJ law firm. So even searching for that exact phrase. Let's they don't show again. up. So, yeah, that's not very so good. If I do the exact phrase, they do show up. But if I just search yeah. for it generically, uh, I don't see them even on the first two pages. I think that goes back to uh, Eric's point of the H5 not having the authority. So it, it definitely, this. Yeah. yeah, nothing there. So now I want to show you a different page, and this is from Nick Schneider. And let's compare, you know, the meta description and the H1s for his page. So I'll pull up his yeah, H1. So here you've got what appears to be, to me at least, a better structure in that yep. you've got only H1 and H2s, uh, but like you were saying that there there should be only H1, H1, but what I see is two. And I see one that is very good, mm -hmm. and I see one that is not, um, yes. at least my, my opinion. So is it possible if he wants to keep this up here at the top in like that big bold formatting to just change the formatting of that text without making it an H1? That's exactly correct. And, and you're 100% you're correct about that. A lot of people choose an H1 or an H2 tag, not necessarily because of the SEO importance of it, but because of the sizing. So automatically uh, in, you know, just browsers uh, out of the box, they're going to make an H1 tag bigger than an H2 tag and an H3 tag. And so a lot of times people will say, you know, I want this text to be a basically roughly, you know, yay, yay big, right? And so they'll say, H1 didn't quite cut it. H2 is a little closer. And so I'm happy with that because it looks the way that I want. And they don't really give any consideration to anything other than the visual to it, of course. But that's you know not going to work most of the time. And so I, I definitely agree with you that I think, uh, to me, honestly, neither of those are actually quite, uh, quite excellent. What I would do is delete the one at the bottom or change that one at the bottom to an H2 that says need a fighter, call Schneider. And I would well, keep I, the I will warn you, Nick Schneider is a boxer and he'll come for you if you say this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I might make his homepage H1, you know, something like uh, uh, injury attorneys, you know, and then whatever the service area that he uh, that he services, however big it might be, whichever one gets the most uh, clicks, uh, I would put that in there. So, you know, personal injury attorney, um, and then whatever the service area is, is what I would change that to. So then here it says that it's missing a meta description. So... Mm -hmm. So that, so we talked about like having one that was discreet, like the last website we looked at had one that we thought, you know, did a better job, but there's not one at all on this page. So what is yeah. the downside of that? So the downside to that is that Google's going to pick whatever they want from your page and create a meta description for you. And so a lot of times, you know, um, Google will ignore a meta description that you provide to it anyway. Google basically has complete control over what they choose to display on the search engine result pages. But by putting your own meta description in there, you're you know giving yourself a very good chance that what you want to be shown to a potential customer will be there. And a lot of times I recommend in this case to put your phone number in that meta description. 
you know, potentially um, your email or, or something like that, just a way for them to be able to contact you without even having to get to the page. But that, but the big downside, like I said, is that they just grab something random. So if you'll scroll down here just a little bit, let's say that they, you know, accidentally grabbed, uh, you know, right here, one of these um, testimonials right here, uh, if you scroll up just a little bit more, or even something from there, you know, let's say your meta description for your homepage was, uh, you know, I hope I'm not involved in another accident, you know, at the bottom of that first one, Google can do crazy things where they just grab whatever they want. And it might not necessarily reflect what you want people to see on it. And so that's why you always should go ahead and do it is it, it really increases the odds of your click through rate uh, being greater by having, you know, more customization. Okay. So what's the next kind of big principle uh, in terms of, you know, doing SEO? Like what's the low, uh, next low hanging fruit people can look at? Yeah, I mean, so there's quite a number of things. You know, we talked already about the fact that you should only have one H1 on each page. You know, we what we talked about the fact that you should have a meta description, right? Well, going a little bit deeper into that, there's actually a maximum uh, length and a minimum length for these meta descriptions as well. And so you want to make sure that your meta description is not longer than 160 characters because Google will chop off the end and put an ellipsis on it. And if it's too short as well, Google's less likely to show what you want them to show and more likely to just grab random code, you know, random text from the page and display it. Uh, but the next thing I, I think is important to talk about has to do with, um, you know, content volume, how fast that a website is putting content out compared to uh, their competitors. And so here's what I mean by that. Google really cares about expertise and they care that the people that they're showing uh, at the top of Google search results are people that know what they're talking about. And a big part of that is, is putting information out there that's accurate. And so if you have, you know, let's say two websites that are targeting the same keyword and all of the details about these two websites are almost exactly the same, you know, the one that's going to be putting out a blog every week instead of every month is in relatively short order going to outpace and outrank the one that is creating content at a slower pace. And so that's another thing that I think is worth mentioning. I think that most websites should be making at least one, two, three, four blogs a month, if not more, if you're in a very competitive market, you know, like you are, Matt. Um, and so that's something worth looking at as well. And so you can go into the sitemap file of any website and you can see in there when the last modification or when the last published date is for each page. And you can get a sense for how often they're publishing or even enhancing and rewriting pages. And you can use that to kind of judge if you're ahead or behind where your competition is. Uh, so one of the things that I did is I made sure that, so if you registered for this event and you're not just like tuning in, like I emailed you a copy of your sitemap. So you can go to the sitemap that I sent you and look at that. But if you didn't get that, all you have to do is like plug in your website and then just type sitemap.xml and then it'll bring up your directory of your sitemaps. So let's say I'm gonna pull my post sitemap. And so what this is gonna do is tell me, you know, the number of pages that I've got, as well as, uh, you know, when they were last modified. Um, but you don't actually, I don't think you have to do that. So we can go to, and I'll start with the AFJ firm, and I went on their blog. So here we've got articles posted, and when we go into them, Let's see if we can find a date. So I don't see a date on that. Does that matter? Uh, so no, it doesn't. Uh, a lot of times websites will hide uh, the published date on a blog. So by default, if you have a WordPress site, WordPress is always going to show the original date that a published uh, that a, that a blog was published. But you can choose, you know, to hide it with a very small amount of code. And a lot of times they'll do that, sort of thinking that they might be able to make Google think that maybe uh, some information is more recent than it actually is. So a blog from five years ago, by not having a date, you know, they think that they can trick Google into thinking that this, you know, blog is more recent than it is. And if you take a look at this, actually, this is interesting. This is a broken uh, sitemap.xml file here. Uh, so when you looked at yours on your website a minute ago, Matt, you saw links and real information. Uh, in this one, you can see that, uh, basically everything is missing right here. So there's something wrong with their sitemap actually. Yeah. Uh, let's see if I can get to it a different way. Maybe let's see. I'll try their post sitemap. 
And while you're doing that, Matt, also to add on to the, the content creation portion, and providing SEO value, I know we talk a lot about the cadence at which we post, but it's also what the content is specifically, whether it's common content, unique content or duplicated content. And Google is smart enough to know, has somebody else on the internet had this content to their site or their blog and have we already indexed it? And if they have, they're going to give that person the value. And if you are plagiarizing essentially, or trying to kind of go through backdoor of, of getting some content on your site to provide value because you see another competitor is, they're going to know about it and you're going to be dinged for that. So I would say the quality of the content and the cadence of the content is going to be important. All right. So I'm going to show you a page on my website. Uh, let's see if it easily. So this is a article, let me give you a better view actually. So this is an article that I wrote for a magazine and it was published in there and then they also published it online. Uh, can I get dinged because the website where this content was published as like news is much more authoritative and you know higher ranking SEO than I am even though I'm the owner and author of this content? So you can't get uh, dinged per se in that uh, you'll have negative consequences across your entire website, right? Like a, some sort of ripple effect. The worst that can happen in a situation like this is that this page itself will just simply fail to rank in Google. Uh, so typically, and uh, I say typically because there are sometimes situations where this goes wrong, but typically the first time that a piece of content is published on the internet, that will be the one that gets the most traffic uh, to the site. Even if you know you published it on your little blog first and then CNN picked it up later, Google you know, generally will have your version rank uh, well. However, there are definitely situations where this goes wrong. And uh, for, let's say that you wrote this blog and some guy from Russia decides to scrape your blog. I've seen situations where a clone, you know, a stolen version of a blog ranks better uh, than the original. And that right there is an interesting situation, kind of gets into, you know, Digital Millennium Copyright Act, DMCA type stuff. But, um, you know, most of the time, yeah, uh, it's, it's, that's not going to be an issue, you know what I mean? But there are certainly things that can go wrong, uh, definitely. Can I spin it through chat GPT like this and get something that's a little more unique? Uh, would that be a better, if, it, if I noticed this page is not ranking? Yeah. Because, like, it's a good article. I've just spent a lot of time and energy on it. Can I just have it? You know, a, a, would I be better off in the long run doing a modified version that maybe says the same things a different way? I mean, so a lot of times, you know, the advice that you would get is that, that that's still kind of duplicate content, right? We're still sort of just spinning yeah. everything that's there. In reality, you in the real world, spinning. can you tell us uh, tell us what spinning is and whether it's good or bad? So spinning generally is bad. Uh, what it is, is taking a paragraph or a sentence, you know, so let's say, you know, my name is Eric Warnke is the, the sentence, right? And somebody spins that around and says, you know, Eric Warnke is my name and sort of Yoda, Yoda eyes is it, right? It's rewriting information again uh, a second time. And Google is supposed to be smart enough to be able to detect when this is happening and honor the original right here and detect the spun version. Uh, it is definitely not smart enough to do that 100% of the time. And I see rewritten, spun articles uh, rank all the time. And uh, so in the real world, I would say that, yes, that is worth trying, which is, you know, taking something like Chad GPT or just rewriting an article yourself if it's been stolen or if it's been published somewhere else first. It works. And, you know, I'm not going to gonna lie about it. Uh, it's definitely a tactic that can work for you. Okay. Uh, I'm going to show you now another website. Uh, with their blog. So this one is uh, the Marks Law Group, and they've got articles coming in, it looks like every, I don't know, every week or two. Mm -hmm. uh, you talk about what is a good cadence for blog articles. Like this is a week or two, and then I'm going to compare this as well to uh, Morgan and Morgan. Uh, and they're posting, you know, one, two, three, four, five a day, it looks like. Yeah. I mean, scroll down a little bit more, if you will, uh, somewhere 12. It definitely seems like they're doing quite a lot of them. And, you know, sometimes uh, 
I wanted to go a little further down. So sometimes, you know, things will get caught in approval for a while. And all of a sudden you'll have five, six, seven, eight blogs get all published on one day, right? Because they've been sitting in a pipeline waiting to get approved for a while. But generally what I do is I look at the keyword that we want this uh, website to rank for, which in this case, you know, let's say for the sake of argument, it's Florida personal injury lawyer, right? I would do that search in Google and I would see what websites are at the top there look at their sitemap and their cadence and see what it is and just make sure that we're ahead of the competition. To me, it's, it's a competition, competition based thing. Google doesn't have any guidelines that will say like, you know, once a week uh, is what we want, but they generally want you to be putting out more information than the other people that they are ranking already. So that's, that's roughly how I gauge that. Okay. So if I'm just looking here, like they're changing today, let's see. All right. So they're changing this. I mean, a lot each day. So they've modified one, you know, 10 pages this day. I see a lot of, uh, one thing I'll mention here is that most of these are, are forward slash attorneys, right? And so it could be possible that they edited like the footer or the header of their website. Uh, yes, yesterday on the 19th. And that's why we're seeing so many hundreds of pages all that say they were changed on one day. You know what I mean? You can have like all retires or something. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So, but if I'm trying to do a takeaway here of like how frequently I should be posting for a blog, like what's the good cadence for your average law firm? Yeah. I mean, a, a good cadence for your average law firm, I would say is, is once a week. Uh, if you can get to twice a week, you know, you're doing awesome. You can get to every other day, every day. You know I mean? That's when you can start dominating the huge markets like Los Angeles and New York. Those, those firms are, are having to do every day. I got you. Okay. So then Let's talk, let's just pick one of these. Um, I'm going to go to Nick Schneider because he's very kind to let us do this here. So I'm going to go um, this playground injury page and let's kind of maybe dig into like this article itself. Yeah. Like if I'm, I'm writing these articles, what are kind of the core principles that I'm wanting to follow to make sure that I'm actually getting benefit from the work I'm putting in? Yeah, I mean, so of course there's the the raw fundamentals, right? Like the the page title itself, the meta description, some of these things that we've already talked about. But I think the one thing that not enough uh, content creators, enough SEO people do is really starting with uh, competitive research. So in this case, there's a title for this uh, this blog right here, which is you know who's liable for a playground accident. What I would do is copy that uh, title of this blog right here, search for it in Google and see what's already at the top of Google for that keyword to get a sense if there's a certain trend, you know what I mean? That uh, that's, that's being uh, seen across all of these. If there are certain questions that are being asked in these over and over. Number three, Number three he's got an article that he published mm -hmm. uh, September 5th. So this month and he's ranking for it. So, yeah, he's already like number two or number three, you know what I mean? And so that says to me, when you see, you know, something in position three after just how long has it been, two weeks or something like that, yeah. that there's a need for this, that, that Google's looking for fresh information about this and there's not enough information going on about there. So I don't know how many clicks that's getting, but the rankings for that in such a short amount of time are, are good. And so there's a lot of things that are going right uh, for this blog just really quickly. He's got a featured image at the top right there, right? with his branding on it at the bottom right there, you can see his logo in, in that image right there. So he's got a custom image. Uh, he's also of course got a lot of uh, bullet points. If you scroll down through this right here. Let's see. So these yeah, are the these proving liability. So Google wants to see, you know, in pages, different kinds of stuff besides just raw text. So they want bullet lists, you know, they want subheadings, they want pictures. And they want, uh, you know, things like this, steps to take, uh, like kind of concrete action. Uh, these kinds of things, you know, um, having more than just text and having, you know, more than just four or five, six paragraphs right here. At a quick glance, you can tell that some effort went into this blog. You know what I mean? And, and I haven't read through it right there to, to gauge it for accuracy, legal accuracy, but we're going to assume that it is all... Uh, completely accurate and in, 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 you know, up to date with the law right here. Right. But this is the generally the level of effort that you want to put in there, which is getting to the, the point of the question, having some rich media in there, for example, pictures, bullet points, even a video 
if you can do it. Uh, all that stuff right there uh, is 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 great right here. And, and so, you know, that's uh, mm -hmm. I give this a, basically a thumbs up for this one blog. Can you tell me how to pull up the alt text for an image? Sure, I can. Yeah, take a right click on that yep. image right there. Okay. And you should get an option that says like inspect uh, or something like that. Are you on Chrome? There it yeah. is. And uh, it's a little small for me to see right here, but that highlighted text right there, you can see actually, I see it now. It says title equals Schneider playground accident. And then to the right of that, it says alt equals nothing. Okay. Take so, so tell me about the importance of alt tags and what, what, what is an alt tag? Why are they important? How can I, and how can I check on my blog if I've got them? Yeah, I mean, every image on a website should have an alternate attribute. And what an alternate attribute is, is basically a little bit of text uh, inside the code of that image that allows people that uh, are blind or have visual disabilities that use this software called screen readers uh, to be able to tell you actually what's going on in the picture. And so Google cares a lot about making the internet uh, accessible to everyone. And when your website makes efforts to try to make the experience for people that are blind or have other kinds of, uh, you know, handicaps and things like that, they give you basically a free boost in the search rankings. And uh, it's, it's definitely an SEO problem if you don't have uh, alternate attributes. But generally, it's supposed to describe in real language what's happening in a picture uh, for people that are blind. So this picture right in front of us, right, what would my alternate attribute be? It would be foreground of a swing on a playground with kids playing on other swings in a blurry background. It's, it's you know, but that's exactly what's going on in that picture. And so that's I would have I'm used doing. Nick Snyder goes wild on playground, leaves empty swings. Um. <laughs> yeah, but you can't do that. I mean, so that's sort of like so I said. Was, was there anything wrong with, look, is there anything wrong with me making my alt text on this image? You know, I am the greatest lawyer alive. Uh, and if you don't hire me, I'm going to, you know, come to your house. And also I'm number one, a plus lawyer best near me. Like, is there any reason to not do that? So I would say that the, the answer to that is like, there is a reason to not do that, which is that you want the user experience to be good, uh, for these people that have visual impairments and it's a slightly less experience. What if like, I don't care about this point? I'm just trying to get my website to rank better. And I just think this is an opportunity to pack in good keywords in, in a way that is not really going to affect the usability of my site for your normal user. Yeah. Uh, like, I mean, so I'll give you the, the, the real answer, which is that you can, you can do that. Uh, Google really checks to see that the alternate attribute is there and they do use the words that you put in that alternate attribute as a part of the ranking factor for the site, but it's very, very, very small. It's a small ranking factor, and so um, you're gonna you're gonna get away with doing that. But uh, it, like I said, it's not the greatest experience for the person that uh, is blind. But if you don't care about them, you can get away with it. It might game Google a little bit. Well, it's got to be better than what I'm doing on my bio here. Uh, which, uh, by the way, OmniZen is not responsible for this part of my website. Uh, my alt tag is City Skyline, and it's a picture of me. Uh, <laughs> yeah, is that like what the background is, or something like that? Oh, it's a home banner. That's what it is. Let me pull me myself. Let's see. Yeah, I'd like to look at just the isolated picture. Well, I don't know how to do that. Uh, there I am. Opti Matt Weatherington. Go ahead and right click that image uh, URL. I did. Inspect. Like uh, in, in the yeah. actual thing there itself. Yeah. I have nothing. I have no alt tag or anything on that. Um, on that one, yeah, yeah there's, there's nothing. But, but what uh, I need to do is after this, you know, is I need to go in there and say, like, greatest lawyer in Atlanta uh, will beat up your lawyer um, if you if you try to hire someone else. I would so, go with uh, with Matt Q, Weatherington, founder, uh, uh, founding partner, attorney of uh, the Weatherington law firm in Atlanta, a personal injury law firm. I would do something like that. Okay, well, that's, well, fine. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's about striking a balance, but, uh, but you, but you should definitely have one there. It definitely should contain the keywords that you want to rank for and describe what's happening in the image ideally. Right. All right. So let's now talk about, and I'll pull up this page here. So I'm going to go to, I'm going to try and load this one again. 
uh, which I will also talk about uh, this right here. So when I go to a website, sometimes I'll see this warning. What is this? Are they going to steal all my information? Well, they're not going to steal all your information immediately, but from coming to the website itself. However, if you fill out a contact form on that website and you hit the submit button at the bottom of it, that information could be stolen. And so really that's what this message is talking about. Uh, so HTTPS uh, comes from this thing called a uh, SSL certificate, which is a secure socket layer. And basically it is uh, something that makes it more difficult for hackers to be able to intercept the communications that you put in contact forms and other types of you know communication relays like chats for example on websites and so if you come up with a website that does not have an https in it or it has that little red x through the padlock right there indicating that it's broken uh, it's not inherently dangerous to visit that website but it is inherently dangerous to submit information through that website so if you click continue to the HTTP site, you'll just reach it, you know, it'll look normal, but I wouldn't uh, fill out the contact form on this one. Well, but now it says connection secure. So take a look uh, at this, uh, if you'll hit the back button for me. So this is the HTTPS www version of the website. Uh, go back for me, if you will, to the version that was broken. I don't think it'll let me, let's try, I'll try reloading it entirely. Yeah, it's not, it's redirecting me now. Try an incognito uh, window if you can. I don't know if it'll show it on the screen share, but delete uh, the HTTP. Yeah. It did, okay. I wanted you to try it uh, with deleting the HTTP and the www at the beginning of the URL and just start with just the family law uh, Vancouver part of it. So in other words, yeah, just start just like that. in a, in a again. So... Yeah. So what this looks to me like is that there's redirects on pages. And yeah. the idea is that you always want to be able to push, be pushing your website to HTTPS, which is the secure version where your users don't get those warnings. And so the idea is like, this appears to be, I don't know if I've just cached the website or not. Um, but what can happen is that is when people go to, for example, just to wfirm.com, if I don't have that redirect in place, they're going to get that security warning. And a lot of times they're just not even going to go to your website. And so the, this is something that is extremely easy to fix. And it's something that takes less than five minutes for any website company. And most website service providers are going to have this built in automatically. So what is the test that people can use to figure out if like they've got this kind of problem? Yeah. So I'll add one other uh, thing to that. So there's two things that are going on in this specific example that we're looking at. The first is the HTTPS at the beginning, and the second was that WWW part in there. So there's two things that are happening even before we load the domain name itself. So the HTTPS is what we call the protocol, right? And the WWW part is what we call the subdomain. In this case, on this specific website, uh, the WWW part is, uh, or sorry, the non-WWW one is the one that doesn't have the SSL certificate and the WWW version one does. And so you actually need to get what's called a wildcard SSL certificate that can handle all of your different subdomains. And so in this case, on this guy's website, Gary Blug, he uses WWW in his domain, right? And so he has the SSL on the WW version of his site. However, on the non WWW version, which would just be HTTPS, you know, without it there, that's where we were seeing that that broken uh, warning earlier there. Um, so that's another thing I wanted to mention. But yeah, here's to answer your question. Here's what you do. Open an incognito tab. So something that doesn't have any cookies or any history associated with it uh, at all. Paste in the URL and then delete the HTTP uh, S part, you know, so that it's just the www. Press enter. See if it works. Do it again a second time with a new incognito window. Get rid of the www so that it's just HTTPS, you know, whatever.com, and then press enter and check if it works. You actually need to check both versions uh, to be able to see if it works uh, or if it's broken. But that's so the, the, the fastest way to check it. So on Nick Schneider's website, as well as the AFJ firm, like both of those seem to be redirecting pro properly. Mm -hmm. uh, let's yep. see if we have another example here to look at. All right, so then let's let's now talk about like 
the links on the website themselves, like inbound linking. And I'll go, I'll go to my page for this. So like on our, on our like auto accident page, what I've got is like a directory, I call it of like moving violations. And then each of these yeah. will go to, you know, a different article about whatever this issue is. Uh, but I've also got outbound links and sometimes those outbound links, like other services, like they just change their web page and they get, you know, they, they go to like a 404 page or, or an error page. Like, can that hurt me? And how can I find those instances? So the answer to that is yes. Uh, so Google um, wants, you know, the information that your website uh, gets out there to be up to date and to, to be accurate. And when you were putting a link to another website on your site, you're essentially in a way vouching for that site and saying, you know, hey, uh, I'm, an, I'm a lawyer and I trust this URL, right? And so when that URL gets deleted, it sort of creates this, this gap in, in, in trust in a certain way. And so if you get enough of these 404s, it, it actually can start to really affect you uh, pretty negatively as well. But uh, yeah, so it's important to make sure that your external links uh, and your internal links are free of any broken links whatsoever. Everything going out and everything going in should resolve to a 200 status, you know, okay status page that just loads normally. Uh, there are numerous ways that you can check for these 404 errors. Um, you know, there's tools like SEMrush, there's tools like Ahrefs, but the tool that I prefer the most for checking that is a tool called Screaming Frog. And so it's a company uh, from England that makes this. It's screamingfrog.co.uk. The tool is free uh, if your website has less than 500 pages on it. Uh, they do charge a small like yearly fee that I forget what it is for the Screaming Frog tool. Yeah, here it is. Uh, if you have a website with more than 500 pages on it, but if you're just checking, for example, you know, the homepage, or you have a smaller site, you could do this and it will spit out for you exactly how many broken links uh, that you have from it. So I love Screaming Frog. Uh, it's a it's a great tool. Uh, and if you have less than 500 pages on your site, it's it's perfect for this kind of thing. If you have Where something I... bigger than that. So I got I need to log in first. Uh, let's see. I can't remember, but I think it's a screenfrog.co.uk forward slash download, I believe is what it is, that you might not have to log in. Let's check. Let's check this. Yeah, it does look like I need to download an app here. So here's the tool. I'm not going to do that right now, but it's the SEO spider tool. That's uh, right. Download, so but... download this little find link. So I'm going to show you the ones that pop up on a refs because uh, I've been talking yeah. a good bit about that today. Uh, so like, for example, it found one on my car accident lawyer page to uh, business times now. So like, let's see. What's, what's my link here? So if I were to go to actually, this is a 301 redirect. Let's see. So can you tell me the difference between a 404 and a 301 and a 402? Yeah, of course. Um, so, so all these are what are called status codes and uh, those come from servers basically. And so a typical page, you know, on a website that is just okay, like a normal page has what's called a 200 status. Uh, 300 statuses are when pages have changed their URL. So let's say I had, you know, wfirm.com forward slash contact. And at some point I decided to rename it uh, wfirm.com forward slash contact us. I'm right? on the wrong, by the way. <laughs> internal. I need broken links in, on internal. Let's see. Yeah, while well, you get there, I'll just explain this real quick. But yeah, 301 uh, status is a page that has changed its URL forever. A 302 status is one that's temporarily changed it. So let's say maybe your homepage is down for maintenance or something. You might want a 302 redirect all the pages of your website to like, you know, maintenance being worked on right now temporarily. Uh, but a 400 is when uh, things are actually broken. So a 400 status is uh, actually a 404 status is when you go to a page that used to exist uh, but no longer exists and has not been 301 redirected anywhere else you'll just hit something that says, you know, not found, right? Uh, but 402 is a status that means payment required. 
And so basically, uh, it, whenever there's like a micro payment system or like some kind of gated content that you need to be able to reach, if you, if you can't get to it, uh, currently with the access that you have, your server will spit, uh, spit out a 402 error. And so that's what that is. That's the difference between the 404 and the 402. Got it. All right. So this is now my broken links on my website. So it says that I've got six, which I think is probably okay. That doesn't sound like much. Uh, but it does show that there are instances where I'm linked, for example, to Georgia Highway Safety that's apparently changed their web page or gone down. I've got some NHTSA links that are broken, yeah. as well as the Consumer Product Safety Commission links that are broken. Uh, let's pull in uh, let's, uh, let's see the whole domain. Domain with all. Let's check this So, So they're doing better. The AJF Law Firm is doing better than me. They've got no broken links. Let's check Snyder. Now, I did see that you had forward slash blog in the last URL there. Um, you I, might I want did to... all the subdomains. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Does Snyder have none? Snyder has none. Uh, come on. Let's see if Morgan & Morgan has some. Surely. I mean, they got hundreds of thousands of page. Yeah, 83. That's a lot. Um, so let's say, for example, that I wanted to be malicious. Like, is there anything stopping me from, for example, purchasing, if one of these domains was available for sale now, purchasing that website and then linking it to my website so that now a high ranking website like Morgan & Morgan is now linking to my website to pick up a back um, yeah, that's a very common uh, SEO strategy, actually, which is uh, buying expired domain names, you know, that had good links uh, coming from them, uh, and then just basically recreating the website and, and, you know, putting the articles back that used to be up there, like it's the old version of the site. That's a very common uh, strategy. And a lot of times that can be pretty good, too, because you can continue to make new articles on there, you know, that give you uh, more backlinks and everything, you have kind of more control over it. Um, but the downside to it is, is you're spending money, right? Because you have to buy that domain name. And now you've got to pay for hosting, right? You've got to pay for the renewals every year. And so you are getting yourself like backlinks by doing that, you know, but, um, but is it, is it worth the shake? You know what I mean? And you kind of need to analyze each of those um, individually, like check what the domain rating is, um, the individual page rankings and stuff like that to be able to get a sense for whether it's worth it or not. It definitely... Uh, is effective, but uh, if, you know, the site had maybe 50, 60, 70 domain rating before it went down, you know, I'd, I'd say that's might be worth it. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about page speed and I'm going to go to page speed. I'm just, if you just type in Google page speed, Google, it'll take you to a variety of sources, but like Google itself has one and I'll pull that one up where you can check the speed of your website. So I'm at page speed insights and yeah, running the analysis of like my website like what this looks like a lot of like technical stuff like what do i actually care about how do i know if like my website's good or not yeah i mean so one of the major things really is uh, like so many other things is comparing yourself uh, to the competition so roughly if you'll scroll down just a little bit for me uh the thing i care the most about is the thing at the bottom left uh underneath that score that says speed index Generally speaking, that's how fast the site loads before you can start actually doing stuff and all the stuff is, is fully loaded, uh, at least above the fold. Uh, and 1.6 is, is very good and a 98 performance score on mobile, you know, is quite good. I'd like if you could click on desktop uh, up there as well. You'll notice they separate desktop versus mobile. And you can see that this is even faster. It's one second faster. So half of a second to load the desktop version one and a half seconds to load mobile. Very common, by the way, to have the mobile version of a website load slower. But generally speaking, what you want to do is you want to check, you know, the people that are ranking at the top of Google for the keywords that you want to rank for and to see what they're doing and make sure that you are faster than them. Uh, roughly speaking, um, 2.5 seconds uh, is what I want to be faster than. You know, between 2.5 and 3 is like, okay you know what i mean i love it but it's slower than three seconds and you know that's uh unacceptable to me gotcha. i do also want to make it known too because i use this quite often when i'm speaking to potential clients that sometimes i get a little pushback of hey well when i go to my website it loads really quickly so i don't know why you're saying it's taking longer than three seconds 
Uh, for people that aren't tech savvy, it may seem a little obvious if you are. Uh, you probably have visited your website several times, maybe even that day. So it is cached in your search history. So it is going to load quickly. That's not going to be a fair assessment. This is for somebody that has never been to your website before. This is their first time they're visiting your site. And I'll, I'll also add that I personally think this is one of the most important attributes. And that is because people will leave your site if you try you click on it. Because they're going to load a couple, they're going to click on the first couple of results. If no. your page is not there, they're gone. Um, and like, that's just the truth of the world. Like, no matter how good your website is when people get there, they're not going to stick around. Uh, so this is Mark's Law Group. I, I, you know, this to me is pretty good. Uh, obviously, it could be faster. Um, yeah, right on the fence right there of where I'd, I'd want to start doing something about it right at three seconds. This, however, I, I wouldn't, I don't think is good. Um, like, I think that the desktop, like he's got 100% best practices, 92 on SEO, but the, well, actually speed's okay as well uh, on that. Why does he have an 88 if he's got such a fast load? Yeah, so if you scroll down a little bit, they'll start to identify some in this area here called diagnostics of like the specific things that they don't like. Uh, so what do they say? Uh, image elements do not have an explicit width and height. Yeah, so a lot of times Google will want you to say inside your image code what the height and width is so that they aren't being, you know, like resizing uh, on so the I just fly. Put gigantic on mine. Is that a good practice? Like I just say like when it says size equal and I say gigantic because I want people to know like big verdicts, big photos. Does that get me where I want to be? Now nah, it's got to be a specific uh, uh, size. So like exactly a thousand pixels or exactly 500. Um, it seems like, you know, just looking at this uh, at first glance, that's the biggest problem that Google has. And so if we were to go and add those uh, height and width elements in here, I'm sure we could get that 88 into, you know, 95 uh, or higher, no problem in just a few minutes. So let's take... Uh... Matt, also going back to your point of the the load speed and people dropping off Google's metric of two and a half seconds, they have that for a reason because they have said that after about three seconds, 50% of people drop off of your site. So basically they, they just never visit and they go elsewhere. So by choosing to not pay attention to this, you're neglecting about 50% of the traffic that could possibly be trying to reach your website. Yeah, so very, very much so. And I want to just mention one other thing really quick. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was a fad, um, which was the, you know, a different type of, of mobile uh, site. Um, and so it would basically make the, the site load like crazy fast without having any kind of CSS, uh, like lightning pages. And um, those right there. Uh, loading. Yeah. Um, so th that's another thing that I don't think is worth doing, by the way, is like having, you know, the, those kind of like lightning pages or whatever, uh, but instead um, just, you know, optimizing your site properly uh, so that everything loads quickly. And you could see here a score 70. Let's scroll down here and see some of these specific issues. Uh, so they've got render blocking resources. So yeah, let's talk about this for a quick second. So the way that most websites work is that they will load like your CSS and your JavaScript files first before they start loading the visual parts of your website. Uh, and really, they'll do it in the order that you have, you know, the things laid out. So if you have all your scripts and your header right, and then in the actual body, you know, you have your, your main uh, uh, content and images and stuff like that. Um, it will slow the site down dramatically to do it that way. And so there are things that you can do to, to improve that, that first issue right there, the render blocking, which is having your JavaScript and CSS load at the same time uh, as your visual parts. They call that asynchronous loading. You can even add a tag, uh, which is called a defer tag, to where you can tell the website to load those scripts after the visual part of the site. Uh, which in, you know, 99% of the time will solve uh, the problem of speed. Um, so there's a lot of things that you can do about these, uh, these problems though. All right. That sounds like a lot of over my head stuff. Is this something that I should be jumping into on my website trying to change? Or is this a situation where I look at this as potentially a, a, a telltale sign of whether my SEO company or my website design like team is doing a good job. 
I think it is a pretty strong indication of uh, of if your team is doing a good job, right? But but there's two aspects at play here, right? There's sort of the SEO aspect, and then there's the development asset uh, aspect of it, right? And a developer, you know what I mean, needs to be able to work well with an SEO if they're not the same person. And it's very common with a lot of agencies to have a development uh, team and an SEO team and for them to collaborate on them. And if that doesn't happen, you know what I mean? If there are not great practices among that development team, then your SEO person, you know, isn't going to be able to do very much. You know what I mean? If they're sort of tied, you know, uh, at the wrists uh, because of the the limitations of their developers. Um, so if you do have a situation like this, you know, it's in your, your, your site is doing bad. That was designed by a company. It's on them to make sure that their site is loading in that 2.5 seconds or less. Uh, and I feel that really every website on the internet should be loading in 2.5 seconds or less. It's an industry standard at this point. And if, if you are above that, uh, then something is wrong, you know, and it, it could be that, uh, your agency or the person that designed your website, uh, is, isn't very knowledgeable about, uh, SEO best practices. So what would you say, and this is one of the things that, uh, I thought was interesting. So Google itself used to say, and I, this is kind of like a Google used to say that like page speed is like one of the very few things that they affirmatively say, like is a ranking factor. Yeah. And so sometimes what I'll hear, uh, SEO companies say is that, well, no, that's not a factor anymore. So we want to like, we don't really emphasize that. Can you, can you talk about what it means that Google doesn't make this as a quote ranking factor and why it's still important to have that page speed aside from the fact that people are going to leave your website from just a pure SEO standpoint? Yeah, I mean, so this gets a little bit into sort of a crystal ball gazing a little bit. Uh, Google doesn't actually really reveal ever, uh, I should say rarely, what the true ranking factors are that uh, impact their search uh, engine. However, you're, like you said, speed is one of the ones that was uh, definitively uh, stated all the way actually back in April of 2010 is when they stated that officially this is a, a true uh, algorithm, you know, a part of our algorithm. And, um, and so I personally believe that it is still a ranking, uh, factor. Um, and they even said in, in 2018 as well, that it's a ranking factor for mobile. And so it's, it's confirmed, you know what I mean? Anybody that says that, that speed is not a verified ranking factor or that it has been removed as a, some kind of verified ranking factor. Uh, is is misinformed. It's it's a hundred percent a factor. I got you. All right. So I want to kind of bring this home in terms of like if someone's trying to figure out like number one like why is your website not working or why are you not getting the results that you want or like is the company that I hired doing a good job? Like is it fair to say that like you can go and look at for example the layout of your H tags in your homepage, the page speed, you know, run that ranking make sure that like you're getting a blog post every you know every so often whatever you've agreed to and that your page doesn't have broken links all over it as a very basic benchmark of like if you're not doing those things you should fire that company i mean is that a fair statement or not to me i think it is a fair statement right so we could take any of those things that you just mentioned to me in isolation and we could say, okay, maybe on this one page on my website, right, they missed an alternate attribute on this one picture or whatever, right? Cool. Um, obviously, that can happen, right? But if you have all 10 of these things that we've been talking about today, right, and it's happening on all images or all pages on the site, right, um, then, then you could kind of just be determined that they're, that they're not putting a forth enough effort to be able to handle the foundational stuff. Maybe they've got kind of, you know, dangly key symptom, right? Where they're going after the next exciting thing and ignoring the raw fundamentals of, of what actually makes a site rank well on Google. But if your you know, website is, is striking out and none of these things are being done or even half of these things aren't being done, uh, it's an extremely bad sign. Very bad sign. Yeah. I mean, and I think that that's, I want to emphasize in isolation, I think every, like, as we saw, like, these are very good websites that we're looking at where people have clearly put effort into it. Like in isolation, none of these are going to be like, oh, this company is not someone for me. But when you're seeing multiple instances of baseline things that are done wrong, it's, it, I do think that it's time to start, you know, taking a second look of where you are. 
Um, 100%. You guys have anything else to add as kind of your final statements here? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of these things, you know, that, that we can talk about, you know, and a couple other ones that I just wanted to mention that I think is a very strong indicator is the uh, mobile experience. So whenever you're looking at your website, you know, literally take your cell phone, pull it up on there and see what it's like to go around to different pages, to open up the menu, to click on the chat, to click on the phone number and dial it. And make sure that this experience is, you know, at least as enjoyable as maybe like the the Facebook app or Instagram. You know what I mean? It shouldn't be a horrible experience trying to be able to find information on your website or being able to figure out like how to be able to contact them or making sure that these things actually work uh, as expected. Um, so that's another important one as well. You know, just making sure that the mobile experience is strong because Google actually uh, indexes mobile sites first before the desktop version. And, uh, and so it's, it's more important now that the mobile experience is good. That's another thing that's worth mentioning is sometimes that experience between being on a desktop and versus being on a phone on a website can be dramatic. And, um, you know, SEO companies nowadays should be thinking mobile first as well. But really, you know, you can take these things right there and look at them. And if more than half of them are, are not being done and you've had them you know, as your SEO company for, for six months, a, a year, two years, five years, you know what I mean? You could, you could be pretty sure that um, either they're not doing their job or they don't understand the, the fundamentals uh, of it well. And somebody that does understand those fundamentals could, you know, make those changes for you relatively quickly and you would do better and get more business uh, out of Google for it. And so um, all this to say, yeah, um, you can take a number of these things in isolation and be able to get a sense for um, if, if the company really knows their stuff or not. Well, what if my website looks like this? Is this good? I mean, because like, I feel like it's always Christmas. Um, it's a black uh, Friday sale. What's, what's their H1? Just curious, Matt. This is a bad. This is 100% risk free. Like, you know, they're doing good. Uh, it's, they don't it's have one. <laughs> they don't have one. <laughs> And let's take a look at this uh, description too. L Bill, L A T V, L A T V. Let's check out Yale Art Schools. Um, oh, this is this is great. These are great. Let's check out Yeah, This is Yale Art Schools website. Let's check theirs. <laughs> are they doing yeah, like that nineties? It's like a nineties retro intentional throwback. I, I'd say right. right? Yeah. That's, gotta be, That's gotta be like, clip. Clip art 94. Like, are we taking bets on whether this is like perfectly laid out or not? <laughs> I bet it's made out of tables and everything too. Back in, back in the day, you used to make websites all in tables. You know what I mean? The whole thing would just be endless uh, series of tables. Look at that. This thing is perfect. <laughs> H1, H4, H2, H3. It's yeah. I mean, you could, you know, it's not it's optimized. Like, you know it's, I mean? It could be optimized, but like, this is not bad. Like, this yeah. is. Like they're doing, like, obviously this is intentional, uh, but so, you know, if your website looks like this though, like maybe, I don't know, get, get someone else. All right. I'd be curious uh, to see what this one looks like on, on mobile as well. <laughs> all right, Garrett, I'm going to give you the last word because you've been the most patient and quiet here. You know what? Hey, I just wanted to say, I always come away learning something new when we get the band together like this. And, and I just want to echo Eric's sentiments in isolation. Any one of these things not having been done, not that big of an issue. But looking at a bird's eye view, if you are seeing consistently that some of these marks aren't being met, then yes, it is certainly time to get out there and explore your other options. And I just want to thank you again, Matt, for the opportunity of having us join today and be another voice uh, on this platform and just act as another resource for your peers. So thank you so much. Absolutely. All right. So let's get back into. So do you want me to talk about the two kinds of SEOs? Yes. This is my philosophy. There are two kinds of SEOs. There are the guys and it's mostly guys who can sell really well and they will close you and they will, you know, they will get that contract. And there are the guys. And again, it's mostly guys who actually can do the SEO really well. And they're very rarely the same person. Uh, the most brilliant SEOs I know, the smartest people in the industry, the ones that are coming up with very creative ideas, they are terrible at business. <laughs> um, so you have the, the two kinds of agencies, and depending on what you're looking for, whether you're looking for the pretty reports or you're looking for the actual results on a budget, you know, that depends who you want to go with. That's all right. So we're... 
for those of you catching up, so we're just jumping right into the round table and Victoria just immediately was just like going to task. And so I, I we're just going to start rolling here. So I'll go around and introduce everyone. And, and first I'll tell you uh, that uh, I asked everyone to be here. There are no sponsorships. No one is like paid to be here or even asked to be here. And in fact, Tanner, I think doesn't want to be here. Um, and I, I rolled him, I basically begged him to come in. Uh, and Corey, I think is probably, uh, you know, surprised that I was like at the last second, like, please, for the love of God, come in here because I think he, everyone here, I think has a lot to offer and a perspective, particularly when it relates to AI and building websites the right way and maintaining them the right way. Uh, I don't mean these as endorsements, but I don't know how you could take it any other way. I think these are very good companies that do a very good job. Um, and so uh, I'll kind of go around and let each of you introduce yourself, starting with Victoria. Uh, tell us that fairly briefly, because we don't have a ton of time, like what your, what your company is, how you fit into the legal space, um, and kind of what your ideal law firm client looks like if someone's watching and thinking like who's the right fit for me so we tend to work with small firms uh one to ten partners uh we focus on delivering the most bang for the buck um you get content you get press releases you get everything you need i don't like to nickel and dime my clients and the idea is that we put your results quick we also don't have contracts we don't have commitments because i've never needed them i don't generally have clients leave so we're kind of the small, you know, agency that really goes after results. I, I, I love it. And Erica, who everyone I think met a little bit earlier as well, I'll let you introduce yourself. Or better yet, I'll let Michael, because Michael is the kind of the, 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 I guess we'll call it like more of the spokesman guy for Omnizen. Do you want to take this one? <laughs> yeah, I'm the, I'm the spokesman. Uh, yeah, so I've been with Omnizen for now a little bit, uh, a year or so, give or take. Um, I've been in digital marketing for 12 plus years, specifically in the legal background for eight years. And Omnizent, just like Victoria mentioned, we do help small to mid-sized businesses, typically one to 10 partners or one to 10 attorneys. Uh, we, we love working in the legal space. That's the only space we work in. We don't cross over to other verticals. And our founder and CEO, Fred Cohen, was actually an attorney himself. He's retired now. He's not a practicing attorney, but we do have a legal background and it starts at the top. Excellent. All right, Tanner, you're up. Great. Matt, thank you for the opportunity. And, and I am, I, I'm very happy to join this and, and definitely have some incredible guests here too. So I'm honored to be part of the mix. Uh, I'm with Consult Webs. I've been with Consult Webs for going on 15 years, uh, but Consult Webs has been around since uh, 1999, so 23 years plus in the industry, and we've been exclusively focused on law firms. Personal injury, that's really our, our wheelhouse. That's where 85, 90% of our clientele sit, and certainly, like the others, uh, smaller, smaller to mid-sized law firms, that is our wheelhouse. We have over 130 people within consult webs and we've we've grown very organically through serving clients around the focus of accountability of data and results period uh, metrics are important but there are a lot of vanity metrics out there so we focus on cost per lead and cost per client acquisition and and we we hang our hat on that uh, just to make sure that if you know it, it's clear whether you're getting results or not i like it Corey, you're up man all right Thanks, Matt. I, and uh, despite the, the short notice, I'm thrilled to be here and uh, really enjoy talking with you and your audience. And, and I echo Tanner's sentiments. This is a this is a killer panel. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of Clixie. We've been in the injury law space since 2012. And um, I think I mean, I, I suppose we also would would throw our hat in the ring and say that we're here to get results. And that that's what we pride ourselves on is genuine revenue producing results and not reporting on fluffy vanity metrics. Um, but I would also probably throw into that some other qualifiers that uh, I think we've really prided ourselves on the longevity of a, of a lot of our retainers. Like we've had clients, our very first client, Richard Harris out of Las Vegas is still a client to this day, uh, you know, since 2012. And so like we focus on high touch uh, accountability, reporting genuine metrics and how does it actually affect bottom line? 
And we're also known, I think, for staying at the forefront of emerging trends. So I think that's really appropriate to, to kind of talk about AI because that's, that's one of those where I think we, uh, we thrive. So here's what we're, this is what we're here for. Like, we want to know your AI secrets. Um, cause like everyone is hearing about AI content. They're hearing about, you know, using GPT to make blog articles, using AI to do all of this kind of stuff. And I think that the true answer is that there is a whole lot of BS and then there's a whole lot of utility. And I suspect that the utility is the stuff that you really don't even see. Um, and that the stuff that we do see is probably the things that are still human touch. So I'll kind of open it up to whoever wants to jump in first, but just big picture, like what are you seeing out there that's actually good? And then we'll talk about the bad. I'm, I'm taking Victoria because she's smiling. Oh, okay. Go ahead. <laughs> Needs to be the first to go. All right. Um, okay. So AI hallucinates, and that's the most important thing for lawyers to know. It will make up cases. It will use their own state in the law. So it'll take a case from New Jersey and it'll apply it in Oklahoma. Um, you have to be very careful if you're using AI to create content. Uh, you have to check every single word, you have to check every single fact, and you have to check every single case. In fact, recently we came across a mention of a, um, I think it was second degree homicide in New Jersey, which doesn't exist in New Jersey on a major, major legal website. Big one. Uh, so not everybody's checking clearly. <laughs> Uh, so it was, it's a, it's a charge that completely doesn't exist in the state. Uh, so you have to be very careful as an attorney. Now, if you're going to use it to create content, which you can, which we do, uh, what you want to do is you want to guide AI. It's a tool. It's not a, um, you know, magic machine. You can just snap your fingers and get what you want. Uh, you have to create prompts that are going to utilize the information you give it and make an article from that information and yeah, you specifically about gpt though when we're talking about prompting like it sounds like what you're talking about is like generative ai tools is what you're talking about is that right yeah so i'm talking about gpt actually what i rec would recommend rather than gpt because the quality of gpt has declined significantly over the past several months uh, because it's it's getting bad data in so it's giving bad data out so we are seeing huge decline in the quality of articles. Uh, what I would recommend would be Po. I believe it's Po.co. It runs on GPT, but it doesn't have the same bad data being fed into it. So the quality of what you will get is actually better. It's same bit of software, but it's 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 slight, you being used slightly differently. Right, so we get much better results. Corey, what do you think about this? Like, tell us about what you're seeing out there and what the good first, and we'll get into the bad. And you're muted. I'll get you. Damn. There you go. Sorry. I think that your initial statement is spot on, and that is that the obvious use cases are usually the the least interesting, and and tend to be where a lot of the charlatans rush in because they see dollar signs, right? And so, uh, I think this whole fervor over being able to 10x or 100x your content output is greatly overestimate or overvalued. Um, I, I think, and, and especially because, well, I'm kind of going down the negative route. So where I think that it's ideally used is for analysis and for deeper insight, right? So, and, and I'll give you an example of that. Say for example, Rather than saying, write me a car accident page, if instead you were to give it your existing car accident page and say, what's missing? What are some topical opportunities that I don't see? Uh, you know, help me break this down. Are there any logical inconsistencies? And, um, and I've, I've, got a, I've got a really killer prompt that I can share with your audience that, that helps with doing sort of a, a heuristic process to uh to arrive at, a, at an ideal prompt 
So what you're talking about is the recursiveness. So when we talked about, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, and that is where you start with your big picture prompt and you say, I'm going to talk about this topic and I want you to give me an outline for this topic. And then I want you to take that part of that outline and I want you to break it down further. And then we're going to keep breaking down to whatever you're satisfied with until eventually you're like, okay, now I'm just basically playing Mad Lib because like the article is done because of the iterative process that I've gone down. Is that what, it, that sounds like that's what you're talking about as well. Yeah, that's, that's one way. Um, and then I also think too that the behind the scenes use that you talk about where you don't really see it a lot is gathering um, large data sets and then analyzing trends and figuring out like what's actually being done. I, I've always kind of been critical of a lot of the, the SEO industry, especially in like the make money niche. Um, they tend to focus on what I call outside in SEO. So they'll go get their uh, tools that analyze their competitors and they say, well, how many words did he write? So oh, he has 10,000 words, I'm gonna write 20,000 words. And, uh, you know, he has 50 backlinks, I'm going to get 60. And I, and I just think that's kind of a hacky way to go about it. And, uh, and so using AI to discover more of the depth of what, a, what, not only what is a competitor doing, but what, how is the algorithm actually responding to those things, I think is, is a really elegant use case. So are you using, so, so first of all, Tanner, I want you to kind of weigh in on kind of where, what you're seeing out there. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree fully. The, the analysis piece is, is where uh, we believe it's going to be and is most effective in, in the moment. I mean, really, the reality is that everyone represented here have had established agencies. They've, they've gotten results for their clients. And so naturally, they've been leaning on their own processes. And, and I believe process is first, what you've established as things that actually produce results, leveraging the technology to build efficiencies in what you have already, that's, that's where the real value is. There has been a lot of uh, just media trash just pushed out there and, and a lot of ideas of you know, creative ways to leverage this outside the norm. But at the, in the end, it's what we've been doing has been working. So now the question is how to how do we continue to build efficiencies in there for our clients in order to stay ahead, remain competitive, and what can we do operationally to continue to manage our own businesses effectively? But specifically content analysis, finding gaps, uh, pulling all of your top ranking competitors, feeding it in there, putting in your content, identifying, asking it to identify gaps of, of content, of value, doing the same thing with title tags, of top ranking sites, comparing it to low ranking sites and identifying what are the differentiating factors. These are all things that will lead SEOs and content writers alike in making sure that they're continuing to build content of value. And that's really what Google's after. So if you can maintain those processes, but find efficiencies using AI, that's the key benefit that we're seeing. So can I give you kind of a low hanging fruit example? So let's say for example, that I pull my site map and I bring in every page and I can then pull the meta description for each of my pages. And I can pull in like the headers or whatever as well. And I were to find pages on my website that didn't have meta descriptions. Could I then use AI to just come up with some placeholder meta descriptions or even permanent ones to fill those gaps on my page of just kind of a technical SEO error right away? You really shouldn't. <laughs> you could, but you should not. So tell me why not. I, I, I mean, are we, are we using different chat GPTs, you guys? Like, I don't know what you guys are using. Maybe using something completely different. The data it gives you is terrible. It gives you really, really bad stuff. You should not use it unedited ever. It's That's bad. Fair. So let's say that I bring in my, my pages and I pull my meta. And I'll, let's see if I can bring up a, an example here. So let's... Um... What you could do is give it your top 10 competitors and then ask it to create a meta description based on those top, top 10 competitors. Now, if you were to do it that way, you would still have to edit it because I can guarantee it's going to be bad, but it's going to be less bad than if you just say, hey, here's a page, write a meta description. And that's, and that's why the prompts, yeah, Victoria is spot on. The prompts are everything in that respect and making but sure remember, it's it doesn't scrape. So ChatGPT is not going to scrape for you. So you have to 
to feed. Either it. use uh, GPT for sheets with with some API or GPT for docs, or you know. So if we're talking with to if we're talking with attorneys, I'm assuming they're not using these complex APIs to create to get these data sets. I'm assuming their their use case is to actually go to chat GPT. So it becomes much more complex, you know, to do it by hand. I think that's right. All right here we go. So I'm going to pull in a GPT created article. So I'm going to pull this guy in. Let's let's take a look at it here. I can get it in text format just so it's easier for people to read. When did you create, by the way? When? Uh, like that mm -hmm. one we were talking. Um, okay. You want to make sure it's not months ago because you're going to get very different results. Let's see if I can spot like this. So what I did is I asked it to, and this might be hard to read. How can I make this bigger? There we go. So I just said how to prevail in a disputed car accident case in Georgia. And so what I did is I asked it to give me an article that was 500 words, a set of FAQs, a short description, an excerpt, and a meta. Uh, so these are the, so this is kind of what it comes back with. I need to go to the second. So talk to me about. So one of the problems. So one of the problems you're going to have if you ask it to create you a longer article on 500 words, right? It's not going to create anything longer. Um, you know, I can't read this quick. I mean, it looks general and probably correct, but is it going to stand out from hundreds of your competitors who are using the exact same process? Uh, and why would Google rank your article as opposed to one of the hundreds of others that are using the same process? So that's the question, though, is like, so what is it that you can do to use GPT to stand out? And how, like, that's, you've nailed the question. Like, if everyone, so when everyone's special, no one's special. So how can we use tools yeah. to become special? So you would have to prompt it part by part. You as a lawyer, you would have, you know, ideas on how to actually proceed with this article. So, you know, if we're talking about a bed source case, right, we're going to talk about uh, the kind of bed source, how bed sores occur, the environments bed sores occur in. And so you have to prompt it, you know, give me an example of environments bed sores occur in and describe, you know, add it into an article or rather write it in a form that you would use on a lawyer's website. And then it would give you the text and you still have to edit it. It's just a, it's just a tool to make it faster. Uh, like Tanner said, you have to have a working process to use this. It's not actually going to, you know, mag be magical. You have to have a working process and then you can use it to create, to make that work faster. Excellent. So does that make so sense? Eric, I'd like to hear what your thoughts are on this. Yeah, so I want to give a, a, a very specific example of something here that we can look at that's concrete. Uh, I wrote an article for uh, an attorney in Los Angeles that has to do with uh, crib recalls. Uh, so if you do a search for the word crib recalls, I think we're number six right now. When we first uh, launched this article, maybe we were like number two or three or something. We've got down a little bit. But in a couple of you know months since I've launched this uh, this chat GPT assisted written article about crib recalls, he's gotten like over a million uh, impressions and, and something like 50,000 clicks or whatever to this page. It's been a, a big monster hit uh, for this new page that we made for him. But what specifically do I think made this crib recall page uh, do well? If you search for JNY, uh, there it is, number five. So, have to, so ahead, bring this tome to AI now. So, yeah. So, what? Here's what I did with this article. Uh, why this article has done so well? Number one, you know, the I think it's so obvious. It's not even worth saying. When you get ChatGPT to kind of spit out an initial version of an article like this, you're not spending so much time thinking about every comma. In every paragraph, a lot of the structure is there right from the get go. And so I get to actually spend more time now doing research. And so what I did was I went back like 20 years and I found pictures and information from like the consumer affairs website about every single crib uh, or crib product, for example, like crib liners that has either caused an accident uh, or a death uh, of a child in like the last 20 years. And I basically said, you know, here's what you do if you have one of these these cribs, right? If you've been affected by it, well, you know, here's what you should do about it. Here's what you reach out to it. And so, you know, a lot of times with it, when it spits out this stuff, whether it's right or whether it's wrong, 
what they're doing is they're saving you mental time for you to think about the research that you have to do to get the actual legal facts, the real information that's going to make your article more useful to people than simply somebody that's just saying like, hey, you know, if you've been injured by a crib, call us, all right? What I gave them was I gave them real examples of actual cribs, real SKU numbers uh, of actual you products. AI to help mine that? Is that what you're saying? Uh, some of it I pulled up manually. Some of it I used AI to to man uh, to to mine, uh, like you were saying, you know. But a lot of this was manual work that I did. But it, because they spit out this first version of it, you know, it freed me an hour, two hours, three hours to do this research that I might have spent Absolutely. otherwise actually just format, like formatting and these things. So that's what one major thing that I think is helpful is just the fact that it spits out okay formatting, which allows my brain to be more free to think about what I can do to elevate this article to make it more useful than what's already out there. And I think that, you know, we're the first law firm uh, that pops up for that word crib recalls. The rest of it's all government websites and consumer affairs stuff. And so that's just one example, right, of, of sort of my brain having more time to actually get in there and, and analyze these facts and, and do these things just because it spits out something that's, you know, an okay intro and an okay outro, you know what I mean? And I just fill out the, the middle of it. And so to answer the earlier question, I think that's maybe to me the most useful thing of all about chat GPT is, is just that um, it, it spits that out for me and I don't have to spend so much time thinking about the layout. The other thing that it's amazing at, by the way, is creating um, like rich media. So Google wants, you know, like HTML tables. If you have a video on your page, they want a transcript of it. I've used ChatGPT to take the raw video transcripts out of YouTube, which are always filled with typos and, and horrible grammar, and just told it to clean it up uh, so that we can just, you know, click here to read the transcript, right? We get a nice clean transcript. I can get some data. I can say, put this in an HTML table for me and just copy and paste it straight in there. Um, there's a lot of cool things that it, that it does uh, is just formatting wise that I found to be really, really helpful. So I got you. Okay, so now let's kind of shift gears and talk about like the bad uses of GPT and like, or not just GPT, but this AI tools and where people are going to just like blow up their websites. Like if I were to put 5,000 new articles up on my website tomorrow from GPT, what's going to happen? I mean, the, bi the biggest thing that's going to happen is, is they probably won't have any chance of ranking. You know, I, I would say if you don't do any editing to these and you're just trying to get speed as fast as possible, it's going to be very close to the clone that the tool is actually scraping it from. And it's not going to be enough to differentiate you from what's already out there. And, and basically, you're just going to waste a bunch of time. It's what I think would be the uh, probably what would happen. Yeah, I, just just to, if I may there, Matt, I would layer on that it, it is not it, it it's it has never been a volume game. It, it has been a quality game. And, and how do you how do you prompts in, in asking it to create, you know, X amount of static practice area pages, X amount of blog content over time? What you're likely going to find is one, there is no unique value between the two pages. But a lot of times you're going to find a lot of content overlapping topical overlapping and in which case you that is it's not necessarily a penalty which we may get into that over time but it's certainly not going to earn you reward in search rankings and so that is that is if if you're in one of our markets i'm sure all of us would advocate go ahead and do that um uh, only because it's going to give us better positioning in the end but that is absolutely one of the biggest mistakes i think one could make i would like for victoria to get to take a uh victory lap here on GPT hallucination. So I asked it for, uh, to make my crib article more reference pizza. And then now I'm like in super far away from crib recalls. Uh, right. Like, However, um, one good use of chat GPT that Google loves, and this is a really quick tip is to create tables from your uh, article. This is something that your, your folks can just take and run with it. They can use it themselves. If you create a chart or a table using ChatGPT and you add that to the article, uh, that will uh, increase the amount of rankings on your article. And I, I only thought about it because I saw you have a table on that. I also, I wanted to, we talked also about like doing like keyword difficulty tools and things like that. I wanted to show, like we talked about like the law, the website that like ranks for uh, crib recalls. And like, you know, this is a massive kudos to Omnizat. Because like, remember what we talked about earlier, and that is that just because you rank 
on a hard keyword doesn't mean that you're the best SEO company because the real trick in a lot of these instances is to find where your competitors are not and where you can start picking up things. Like this has a traffic potential of 200, but in literally what Eric says, like in like minutes, he was able to put together an article that is now ranking in the top page for this. And he's gonna get long, long tail also ranks for, for recall, California recall lists, which have much higher volumes than just crib recall and be able to turn that into something that you can launch off of for other things. Uh, and I was just looking at that and wanted to point that out as well, where like here he's, you know, spent, you know, not much time putting together an article, but was able to get it to rank immediately and gets benefit of that for a long time. And you can just extract that from a lot of other areas. Um, can we talk a little bit about using GPT to create content strategies themselves? Uh, so what I mean by that is like, let's say that I'm a lawyer and go ahead to Corey, you want to weigh in before I get to subjects? You're muted again. You're muted, Corey. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to weigh in on one last thing about like what could go wrong, because I think this was alluded to, but, but wasn't like in depth described. Um, so on the one hand, it, one outcome is conceivably that you publish your 5,000 articles and, and nothing happens or it just doesn't work or whatever. I think the worst outcome is that you do rank because of it. You do get a bunch of new uh, pages that are being indexed. And then what can happen is if you were to, if you were to able to sort of watch side by side their search console and see all of a sudden they get this massive spike in impressions Right. So all these pages ranking for somewhere in the index and then you're getting nothing from it. You're getting no clicks, no actual visits or really high bounce rate. So you get a ton of traffic that hits and then it's out. Right. I think that's actually worse because that could end up causing issues for the good parts of your site. Mm -hmm. Like you could end up actually harming yourself in the long run. Uh, if that scenario occurs and I've, and I've seen that I've seen in these SEO forums, I see all these guys bragging, like we put up 50,000 new pages in the last six. I was months just trying to find and... a good screenshot to throw up for you. Like you, I, I was thinking the exact same thing and then you watch it and it just goes, yeah, boom. But for those guys and, yeah. the re and you'll hear those success stories and they'll brag about them because those are success stories for them. Like if you're trying to like push like a, yeah. a, a site that's selling a product or like an Amazon reseller kind of nonsense, like, great. Like you're more than happy to take your hundreds of thousands of dollars that you earned what, during your like quick bump. But if you're running a law firm mm -hmm. and a real business that where your reputation matters in the long term, this stuff is toxic and will kill you. It's important. Yeah. Yeah. hundred yeah. percent. You have to have good metrics on your website. If you don't have a good, good click through rate, if people aren't staying on your site, you're not going to rank those PI pages. You're just not, yep. it's not going to happen. So, uh, we're kind of coming up near the end and, but what I wanted to talk about as well is like kind of takeaways. Like one of the things that I think GPT is good for is giving you high level strategies for what you're doing. Like if you were to ask GPT to help you create a marketing plan for your firm or a social media plan for your firm. I, I believe that GPT does a very good job at that. Like it'll tell you like, these are the kinds of things that you should post. These are the frequency that you should post them. This is the link that they should post. And then from there, you can apply your knowledge and experience within the framework that it gives you, as opposed to then saying, now give me the content that I'm going to post. Like would, would anyone disagree with that or agree with that? Yeah, I don't disagree at all. Um, I think it's it's perfect as a sidekick, and I think it's terrible as a lead, mm -hmm. right? Like, so it's going to – I think I heard this somewhere that, like, it isn't the businesses who uh, – like, I can't remember how it, this was phrased, but I, I liked the, the sentiment behind it. But it was, like, the people who are already good who learn to use AI as an augment are the ones who are going to win – kind of, I think, harkens back to what Tanner was saying about having ex established processes. It's like, this is going to, this is going to make good people better and great people amazing. 
Excellent. All right, my last question for you guys. Uh, is like a lot. <laughs> like I, I feel like that I've asked, been asked this question a million times. Uh, and so anyone is welcome to take this one. I mean, I would, I would say to this, uh, can you get a ban from it at, at the surface, uh, just using it, you know what I mean? Is a no, uh, just simply using AI content will not really get you banned. However, if you're coming at it from a place of, uh, being disingenuous, right. And you're, you're intentionally keyword stuffing, you're intentionally putting links in there to try to game things. And, you know, you're, you're using that sort of to enhance existing black hat SEO stuff that's already going on. Uh, absolutely. That could be the straw that breaks the camel's back, but I don't think that any like one article in and of itself or whatever is going to ever result in just like you're shut off, you know, as a result of it. I got to jump in there. Um, we've done tests where we've done all kinds of crazy things. There's no such thing as over optimization, but even if there were, if you think about it, Google's got billions of pages and millions of them coming on, on, you know, up every single day they have trouble indexing things because there's just so much and for them to sit there and try to decipher whether you know you're not using ai on a page unless you're a fortune 100 company would make absolutely no sense they just don't have that in their algos and even if they did have in their in the algos it's very hard to to figure out what ai text is uh, i can take any one of these ai predictors and put in a dash and the AI prediction will go from 100% to 0% if you put it in the right place. So it's just, there's just no way. It's just not scalable, you know, especially if everybody is using AI. Excellent. All right. Cool. I, yeah. I, think, I think there's few things as misunderstood as penalties as it relates to Google. Like, I, I would, in fact, I'm going to take a controversial position. Maybe some of you guys are going to dis totally disagree with me. I think Google's moved to a point where I don't even know that the penalties as they used to be conceived of during the penguin pa panda days. I don't even know that that thing exists really as much. Um, yes. It's become too sophisticated and smart. And what you see, the, the way you know that you've been so-called penalized is go look at your search console and watch your impressions just nosedive, right? There's, I think that it's greatly overstated the idea. And by the way, Google is an AI. <laughs> so I don't know. The, I think the notion of it's going to penalize me is just is is greatly overblown. In fact, Google just recently came out and said, uh, I, I'll, I'll have to find the exact reference, but more or less what I've seen from John Mueller and several other sources is like, no, the inherent use of AI is not a problem. If you're if you're following guidelines, if you're being helpful, if you're creating great content, that's right. They say they'll reward high quality content, however it is produced. Excellent. All right. Uh, Very recent change. In the, in the past, they did uh, ask you to actually have a disclaimer on the page that says something to the effect of this page was written, you know, with uh, the assistance of AI. Uh, they no longer require that now. I, I did see that as well. All right. Well, excellent, guys. Well, we're going to move into our next topic. Now let's move into applying some of this stuff kind of to the real world and using AI and these AI tools uh, to create, you know, content and do it in a way that's actually going to be helpful. And before we do that, like, here's the caveat. It's like, if you just use GPT without proper oversight, you will lose your bar license. You will commit errors. You will do something stupid. Don't do it. Like everything that I'm showing you requires oversight, careful attention to detail, and it's a tool, not a final end product. Like let it supplement what you're doing and solve problems. Don't let it create new problems. Uh, for example, down here, like AI, this is deep fake Matt versus real Matt. And like, they're, they're very similar. All right, let's get into GPT. And I'm going to presume that you've got at least a baseline understanding of how to use GPT. And if not, then start by watching one of the other presentations. Uh, the future of law is probably going to give you the best background, uh, but I'm going to presume as we move forward in this that you've got some basic understanding of it and the first thing i want to show you is i have gpt set up 
So if you're on a GPT plus plan, which I do recommend, you can do this for free, but the difference between 3.5 and 4 is just, to me, too overwhelming to not go with the pay GPT plus. Uh, and what I do is I go over to custom instructions and I'm going to show you my custom instructions on how I set up GPT, which is where you can give it what I'll call preliminary prompts. And so what I've got is I've got it set up to say, you know, I'm geographically in Atlanta. I'm an injury attorney. I want precise answers. Um, I want you to, you know, be factual. I want you to give me markdown formatted links instead of inline text. And I'll, that's, that'll be important for reasons I'm going to show you in a second. I want you to give me links and citations to cases uh, so that I'm trying to minimize the amount of uh, hallucination. Uh, I want it to give me links to paper to papers to back up everything that it's saying. Um, and I want it to give me links to Google the things that can help. Um, I dislike being reminded of them talking to an AI. So what I'm trying to do is get it to stop saying things like, as an AI, I can't talk to you about X or I'm not a lawyer and therefore, you know, don't listen to me because I'm doing this because I'm going to review the content. I don't want something that is like draft ready. Um, I also am not, I'm also wanting to discourage it from telling me that it should get legal advice from a lawyer. Like I am a practicing attorney. I don't need the preamble. Uh, I also am setting it up so that I can choose how detailed my response is. So I can say, I can change the length of my the response that I'm getting just by changing this verbosity. Uh, I'm also then able to kind of set parameters for how I want it to respond. And I will copy this and I will put it up at wfirm.com slash AI. I, I see people asking for this. More than happy to give this to you um, so that you can use it. Uh, and you, you access it just by going under your account. Uh, like when you see your name at the bottom, you click that and you say custom instructions, and then you can put that in there. So, and the reason why I do that is, so let's say that I gave it just a generic prompt. Um, like, let's say like, tell me about Atlanta pizza. What it'll do with my prompt is it'll then set up and try and interpret what I'm trying to do. It'll identify the kind of expert that is needed for it, and then it'll give you, read me back at the assumptions that it's giving me about my prompt. So I can look at those assumptions and then immediately catch whether it understands what I want. And if not, I can then tweak my prompt uh, or not. Uh, and I can have a conversation and pull it back up. Um, I also ask it to check my logic and see if like I'm just starting from a false premise. Like for example, if I were to ask it, you know, tell me about pizza in good pizza in Kansas, I would expect it to say like there's no such thing as good pizza in Kansas. That's a bad question. Um, so then it's going to start giving me my answer based on that preamble. And the idea is just keep it from hallucinating, keep the answers tight and keep the answers accurate. Uh, and I will tell you, this is pretty good. So Antico is, it's right. And it, it's got a very nice Neapolitan pizza, but I personally don't like that. Like if you want to have like a really, really nice spot, uh, slice of pizza in Atlanta, uh, Versano's is going to be a lot better. Uh, as well as Fellini's. Uh, Fellini's is not a New York style slice. It's a little bit something else. Uh, I wouldn't call it New York, but this is a pretty good answer. But then I'm also going to get down here at the bottom, uh, Google searches, uh, as well as uh, like backup material for its answer. So like I would expect that this would be, you know, a search for that exact article on Eater. Uh, and it is. So this is from Eater, it's their website on pizza, doesn't matter. But the point is that that is how I set up my prompts. And as you're using this for marketing material, you always wanna keep in mind that this is gonna be an iterative process. I am not going to ask this to write an article about car accidents. Like that's not what I'm gonna do. The first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to go to my website and I'm gonna pull up my, you know, whatever article that I'm trying to work on. So I'll pull up our car accident lawyer page. And what I'll do is I'll just copy in you know, the first half of this. And then I'll ask GPT it to identify areas of this article
And in fact, I actually think I should start another step backwards. And instead of starting there, what I instead want to do is I want to ask it for best practices for what I'm about to do. So instead, I'm going to ask it to please provide best practices for taking existing website content uh, and expanding on it without cannibalizing or otherwise affecting So I'm going to give it this prompt here to tell it, like, let's start by just getting the principles of what we're trying to accomplish. So it's going to identify an expert, which is the SEO specialist. Um, you have a web, and it's going to give me my assumption, which is um, probably not true. Um, like we are optimizing for search uh, every day, getting better. But yeah, this is fine. Um, so. And it correctly identifies my concern, which is expanding website content can improve the, the, the SEO performance, but you can also cannibalize existing content. And what that means is essentially where you've got a situation where you have one page is performing okay, and then you have another page that's meant to expand on that. But what ends up happening is that both pages then take a hit because neither one is authoritative. And so the idea is to try and used alternative techniques to keep that from happening, including the topic clustering, um, using different tags, like this is all correct. And so when we talked earlier about like how GPT can like take you off on the wrong path, if you're trying to ask it to like give you a final product, what I've noticed is that GPT absolutely does not get you off on the wrong path when you are tr using it in a way that is setting up structures, issue spotting and laying out a plan. So now I've, it's laid out its plan for how to expand content. And now I'm going to give it the content and I'm going to say applying those best principles. Please provide areas to expand this content. And then now it's not just an SEO specialist. It's also a content strategist is the expert role that it is playing. And so it's going to bring this content in. So This is fine. Let's let's just pick one of these. Case studies, it's right. Like we don't have good case studies on our website right now, and particularly on that page. Um, we do have a discussion of state laws. So what I did is I cut off before I got to that section of our page. Uh, but we do have individual blog articles for like moving violations and things like that. Uh, but it did good a job of catching that that wasn't in the snippet that I gave. Uh, FAQs we probably don't have. Let's take a look. Uh, we got a couple. Uh, we could probably expand on those. Uh, contributory and comparative negligence. Now that's a topic that's prob that's not well covered on that article. So we'll just pick that one. All right. So we'll start here on contributory and comparative negligence. And what I'm going to do first is I'm going to go through like my inventory of briefs and, and cases and try and find something that is like on point for contributory contributory and comparative negligence. So um, let me poke around for just a second here. I'm, I may need to change my screen share here, uh, but what I'm gonna do is first get for best practices from an SEO and ethical legal advertising for drafting an article is a branch of a primary article. So we'll start there. Uh, also take into account
And while it's doing that, I'm going to jump over into our Wikipedia, like internal knowledge base, and I'm going to try and pull some information on contributory negligence that I can use to supplement whatever it is that we're writing. Let's see. All right, so. This is all we've got, at least on contributory negative. So I'll just take all of this and then I'll go back to my article. And before I do that, if you want your own wiki, uh, there's also this article that I've written on building one out for yourself so that you've got everything that you need to uh, have all of your firm's internal information and knowledge in one place for free. Uh, and I've got a full guide on how to make that on our at wfirm.com slash blog. Or you can just Google WFIRM knowledge base and it'll bring you that bring you that article. All right. So I'm getting back into GPT and I'm going to and it, it's repeated back to me the best practice for SEO, the best practice for advertising, uh, which is what we want to do. So now we're going to give it provide here is additional context. Please draft the initial outline of the article using this content. And I'll just copy and paste it in, and then let's see where we are. So it's coming back. Uh, now it's a legal content strategist, and it's got the context of what I'm looking for, right? And it's going to now start giving me the outline. So I could at this point just say like write the article, but I don't think it's going to give you as clear and strong as an article as if you just continue to follow this iterative process. So what we're going to do next is we're just going to drill down now into the first paragraph. And so I'm going to let it keep writing, but I'm going to go ahead and start telling it now following the best practices for SEO uh, and using contributory negligence as the keyword. Use the keyword in the title and in the first sentence while expanding, excuse me, while following the best practices to avoid cannibalization. It's probably spelled wrong and it is. On this topic. Okay. So we've got our outline. What is contributory negligence? Contributing negligence in Georgia, comparative versus modified, how Georgia law calculates damages, doctrine of avoidance of consequences, importance of legal consultation. Right, this is all fine. So now let's see what it's going to give us for our outline of the first paragraph. I didn't like that, so we'll regenerate. Oh, I didn't actually ask it to give me uh, my article yet. So I'm going to stop this. And anytime that you've realized that you've just made a mistake in your prompt, all you got to do is just stop it, come back up here to edit. Uh, and instead, what I want to do is keyword draft the outline of the first paragraph. There we go. So now it should give us an actual outline for the first paragraph. And we're just going to continue this process over and over for each paragraph. And then once you've got a process in place that you like, what you can do is you can just standardize that and turn that into a series of prompts. And once you've done that, you can then move into a different program like Excel or Google Sheets and have it where this process is automated for you. Or you can even go so far as turning this into a Python script. Uh, I've got a separate video on doing that uh, that would then just iterate this process over and over so you can generate content at scale that's not just going to be like garbage. Uh, because if you were to just type into GPT, draft me an article about contributory negligence, it's not going to be nearly as good as what we're going to create using this process. Um, All right, so this is fine. All right, so now we'll ask it to draft the first paragraph. If 
following all of the best practices. And then what I'm also going to do is I'm going to move over and grab the WFIRM uh, sitemap, which uh, if you remember that when you registered, I sent you an email with your sitemap so you can use this as well. Uh, and I'm going to pull my post sitemap. And I'm just going to grab these. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask it to now outline the second paragraph and also find an opportunity and I'm going to put in my sitemap here and just ask it to find an internal link so So notice now that we've already got off field, and this is why I used the, the approach that I did. So notice that it's now stopped trying to write an article about contributory negligence, and now it's focused on tire safety. Um, and it's doing that, I guess, because of the emphasis on tire safety in our sitemap. But by having that pre-prompt that I showed you, you're able to catch that immediately. So like, I don't have to like read through this and be like, um, oh, what happened? Why am I all of a sudden <laughs> delving into the why behind proper tire storage? Uh, so I'm going to come back up here. And what I can do instead is I can edit this and I can take this away. And I can just use 3.5 for this. And I'm just going to copy and paste the same thing in, in 3.5 just to see if I can get maybe a little bit quicker uh, response without having the additional context that we've already built into this uh, and see if we don't get a we can avoid a hallucination this time and yes it did so we're getting articles related to contributory negligence from our sitemap and I'm gonna ask you to give it another go and see if we can get some more One of the things you'll notice is that this is converting it into hyperlinks and 3.5 is not using my pre-built instructions, one of which was don't give me hyperlinks, instead give me uh, plain text links. Uh, so if I were to copy and paste this, I would just have the text of that link, whereas I can click it and it'll go to the page and that can be helpful. Uh, but I want the hyperlinks in this instance. So what I'm going to ask it for is to just please list the plain text. And so now I'm going to get my list of links and I'm going to take this back now to four and continue editing our article. this. I'll just grab those first couple. So we go back into our previous chat with four. Give it a second to load. Our knots here. And remember we stopped it when it started talking about tires. So I'm going to come back up here. And now we're going to say outline the second paragraph and also include links to at least two of these articles. So it's going to repeat back to me again, like what our assumptions are and its logic. This is correct this time. It's doing the second paragraph of contributory negligence. So we're like still on course. We're not hallucinating. Um, and this is fine. So 
but we'll see how this looks. So we'll say now draft the out, draft the R paragraph itself. Just, and you can just continue this on through each paragraph and make it as long as that you want to. And what you're going to get in the end is something that is a lot better than just saying, for example, give me an article on contributory negligence. Um, you're going to be able to get your inbound links included. You're going to have your, uh, like, basically everything that you really want in your article. And also can put in parameters like include this keyword density or use the keyword this this percentage of the content and kind of just go through it however I want to. Uh, so additionally, you can then start making this like pragmatic and like I'll show you on our website, like an example of one that just following this process to the end. Uh, let's see. So we did this one on product liability complaints. Um, and in this case, we just follow the product's liability stuff. Uh, commonly overlooked claims and theories, pitfalls, common mistakes. I uh, included a little teaser at the end about pizza. Uh, this is not a very good article, uh, but it does show you just kind of the like where this can end once you start adding in your images and your headings and things like that. So we'll presume that we've kind of jumped to the end of making that article. So let's go look at how we can end this. So the, the last thing that I can do is say, all right, great. We'll just have it finish the rest of it. Now draft the rest of the article. And also include a meta description, uh, Im image uh, alt tags, and a feature image prompt for stable diffusion. What's going to come back with is, you know, hopefully, you know, the full article at this point. I don't know that it's going to be perfect just because we're kind of skipping a bunch of steps. Um, but kind of to sum up kind of what we're doing here. So you're starting at the top and you're saying, give me, you know, an outline for a good article. Like, what is that? And what does that look like? Like, I want to expand on content. Give me the best practices. You're then going to say, here's the content, identify opportunities for expansion. It's then going to do that. It's going to say, here are areas that you can improve. You're then going to pick one of those, and you're going to ask it to give you an outline for doing that. You then follow that outline down, and you then give it the, the context that it needs to be accurate, as opposed to asking it to just make things up for you. You then give it that additional content. It's then going to give you the outline. And you just start going through and saying, applying these best practices, give me an outline for the first paragraph, then write the first paragraph. Give me an outline for the second paragraph, write it. And you can then, as you get a little bit more advanced, you can start adding in things like including links from the sitemap, uh, including inbound links, including meta tags and descriptions. So here's our meta description. Here's our feature image prompt. And then I can go and take this into an image generation tool uh, and we'll We'll look at some of those in just a second. It's giving me my alt text for our images, and now it's giving me my, my full article. Um, and you'll note that when I start skipping steps, like this is relatively bad all of a sudden. Like these next three uh, paragraphs are not as good as they as we were creating already. Um, and that's why that iterative process is so important. And it can and it takes time. And because it takes so much time, that's why you're we're going to want to get a workflow that works for you and then start finding ways to then have that workflow automated so that you're not having to do this manually because it's very tedious. And what I would prefer to be able to do is get 10 articles and then edit those 10 articles because they were made through the API instead of having to go through this process manually. But you can do that if you're trying to just do something, you know, to get it out the door on a particular topic or you're just trying to learn these tools. All right, now I want to take just a second and do what I'm calling like a reverse sponsorship. So hang on, let me get this queued up. One of the things that I did with the seminar is that I'm not letting companies sponsor this or 
pay any money to like be a part of it. And so everyone that you see is someone that like I thought added value to what you're getting. Uh, and but the exception, though, is with the Free Law Project and Mike Listener. And instead of him paying to be here, even asking to be here, I basically begged him to come and tell you about what he's doing so that you can learn more about what the Free Law Project is, what it does, and why we should give it our money. Uh, so opposed to him saying he wants to sell you something, I'm telling you we should just give Mike Listener and the Free Law Project money. Uh, so Mike, tell us what the Free Law Project is and what you're doing. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Matt, for having me here. Um, this is a really nice opportunity. Um, and I can go on for a long time about Free Law Project. I'm the executive director there, and we've been working to make the legal sector better for over a decade now. So there's a lot to say. Um, but the big picture is that we try to find places where the market fails uh, the legal sector or where a little bit of government help in terms of a policy or a tweak to a law um, can make a big difference. Um, with, with the big picture being that we want to have a competitive uh, world when it comes to legal tech. Um, and that means we need good data. That means we need good technology. Um, and so we have a bunch of different initiatives in, in those areas. Um, and we you know, push bills through Congress where it matters. Um, and we build systems where that can help the sector. Excellent. So what are the products that we've all probably seen that you're behind? Yeah, so um, if you've ever seen um, Recap, uh, we, we run the Recap Archive. That's a tool for um, for essentially breaking down the Pacer paywall. Um, so it's a lot of lawyers here. You guys all probably know uh, Pacer, and it is the biggest paywall in the world. Uh, so our first, you know, one of our biggest systems that we have is Recap, and you just install it in your browser, and everything you buy in Pacer, you contribute to the public commons. Um, so that's a big one. The other one that folks probably seen, which works sort of hand in glove with Recap, uh, is Court Listener. Um, and so when you contribute to the public commons, that goes into Court Listener. We upload that to Internet Archive, so it's um, publicly in the digital library. Uh, we make it searchable on Court Listener, um, and we're constantly working there to have all kinds of data, uh, whether it's the financial disclosures of federal judges, federal filings. Uh, we have over three data on about 300 million federal filings in there. Uh, we have a database of opinions that, uh, that Matt is looking at now. We're working on making that complete. Uh, that's been a project for 10 years because once there's a complete and open data set of every uh, legal decision ever, um, there's going to be a lot of innovation that comes out of that. Um, so that's been a, a long sort of project we've been working on. Um, Matt's looking at oral arguments now. It's the biggest collection of oral argument audio on the internet database of judges, um, and there's just a whole lot more. Those are sort of the high level things there. Um, and then we have sort no, of- I have a single entry. I mean, I've never been to the US Supreme Court, but- <laughs> <laughs> No oral arguments for you uh, in the system yet, apparently. Um, but you know, that's sort of getting at the problem. Um, you've obviously had oral arguments, so where are they, right? Um, and we try to collect as much as we can, but the legal system is huge. Um, and so it's one of those things, if we have more resources, well, we would have you in there, right? Excellent. Where does the money that I contribute go to? Yeah, so when you contribute to Free Law Project, we have a couple of big expenses. The first one is just developers. Um, we run at just a huge scale. And um, to operate at that scale, you got to pay developers. They cost a lot, of, a lot of money to keep the system up. Um, everybody knows, you know, these days it's, it's hard to run that. Um, and then the second one is just sort of general overhead. Uh, my salary, we have a development staff. Uh, um, she does fundraising and um, so, you know, it goes towards that. Um, and we do advocacy work as well. So um, when you donate, some of your money goes towards that. And that could be, you know, our work to make Pacer totally free and bring down the Pacer paywall. Um, it can be work around bringing FOIA to the judiciary. Um, and you know we have a bunch of things like that. AI is being challenged in certain courts. It's been blocked in one court in Texas already. Um, and you know so we're sort of saying yes, uh, AI is new and AI is a little scary, but um, you know used correctly, it can be very powerful. Let's not be afraid of technology. Um, so those are kind of the main three directions uh, where, where we spend our resources. 
Excellent. Well, Mike, thank you very much for coming on. And if you got any value of what we've shown you today, uh, which I would suggest is that I've all, we've offered you incredible value today. Uh, and it's not costing you a dime to come and come to the seminar. And, but if you have found value, I would strongly encourage and request that you go to free.law slash donate and make a contribution to the free law project. Uh, any amount helps, uh, but like realistically, you're wanting to be giving larger donations. Like we're dealing with very expensive projects that are very difficult to implement, but are foundational to having a free and open civil and criminal justice system. So please go and make a donation to free.law slash donate. Uh, and Mike, thanks for coming on. Now let's get into the data analysis thing. And this is something that I've spent months working on. So last year I published a list of SEO companies and how many people had hired them, how many people had fired them, how well they ranked for their clients and you know a couple of other metrics and almost universally every SEO company said this is really great but it's not quite accurate for us. Uh, and it was used and it was a very good jumping off point but I got a lot of feedback on how to make it better. So this time around, here's what I've done. I took 50 highly competitive keywords, or at least they're generally competitive in a variety of markets. I then pulled the top 50 MSAs in the United States. I then pulled every city that was in each of those MSAs. And what I did was I ran each of these 50 searches on each of these 122 locations. And I did it both with just the name of the city and with the city and the state. And as a result, I ended up with 60,000 or 61,000 websites. And I learned a lot from looking at these 61,000 websites. Like there are just mountains of these websites and they're all over the place in terms of their quality. And it's surprising what ranks in some areas and what it takes to rank in other areas. So let's first look at like, if we just look at these 61,000 websites and we just break it down to the most common domains, domains that we see. So number one, I wanna point out that a thousand of these websites had 404 errors. That's a thousand websites that right this second are ranking on the front page of Google for a competi relatively competitive keyword that have no website behind them and are just waiting for another you know, website to come up behind them and take it. Justia, Super Lawyers, Fine Law, and Yelp uh, really round out the top. And that's not necessarily surprising because they're spending mountains of cash to rank for these keywords so that they can then sell directory listing services. So, and it turns into this kind of hand in glove situation where Super Lawyer spends thousands and thousands of dollars to rank for a keyword and then makes you pay them thousands and thousands of dollars to be listed on their website. And then lawyers will then link back to Super Lawyers, which is cannibalizing their search terms by saying, I'm a Super Lawyer, look at my profile in Super Lawyers. So the same thing is happening with Justia as well with their listing of cases and, uh, like opinions and things like that. So like they're both kind of got it figured out here. Um, so like kudos to them. Uh, there are a couple of lawyer websites that crack into the tippy top of like overall domains here. Uh, the yellow domains are done in house. And I will point out that uh, Clazing Associates is run by Seth Prince and Seth is the founder of Blue Shark Digital. And Blue Shark is a very good uh, SEO company. And unfortunately, they're not in a lot of the rankings that I'm gonna show you because they're an ethical, upstanding, wonderful company who doesn't put links at the bottom of websites, which is what I'm using to track and show you some of this other data. Uh, of those, the two lawyers in green, Smith, uh, Smith and Duello and Ben Crump. So Smith, I think is using Create 180 Design and Ben Crump is using uh, Brandylytics. Uh, so what I did for all 60,000 of these websites is I then put them through uh, 
a process to pull out their meta information, the links on their websites, and just general information about the web page. And the reason why is because at the bottom of most lawyer websites is going to be a link that says this site was by whoever. In this case, it was Clixy. And I can then use that link on all these websites to start building a repository or at least a database of which companies are responsible for which websites. And what I did, and through this process, I found 681 SEO companies. And that's a lot, like 608 companies that have put at least one website on the front page of Google for at least one reasonably competitive term. And just for the data fun of this, like here's the list of by prevalence of which domains showed up the most that are doing the SEO company. So I included Fine Lawn Just Dia to give you kind of a, uh, a reference. So Scorpion, Matador, iLawyer, uh, Mile Mark Media, those guys are at the very top. And so if you want to fall into the bear trap, like what you do is you say, well, obviously these guys know what they're doing. So I'm just going to hire the ones who have done it the most. But you now know because you understand how keyword difficulty and volume works that we can dig deeper. Um, I also want to take a step back and note that BPSE also doesn't do links at the bottom. So I don't have data for them either. And that's another very good company. Uh, and so I'm not trying to slight Blue Shark or BPSE. I just don't have a way of tracking them. All right. So you get this list of, you know, supposedly like high prevalence companies that are in the top 10, but we've still got to ask the question of how hard were those attempt, those results to obtain? How frequently were those re are those results obtained for their other clients? And what's the budget that they're working with? And I mentioned budget because one of the companies that was on here had a pretty big fall off from last year. So I reached out to him and I said, hey, why is it that you guys are ranking lower? Uh, like, why is it that you, you know, coming in lower on like some of these like metrics and what they, and I'm not going to name them because I'm not trying to embarrass them. But what they told me, and I think there's some truth to this, is that they work with people with whatever budget they have and the overall budget of their clients has gone down. And as a result, so have the results, but you put them against any other, you know, SEO company with the exact same budget and they'll beat them is what they're saying. And I think there's probably some truth to that. So I also would take some of this data with a grain of salt because the methodology that I'm going to show you is going to be more important than the data. What the data is going to do is lead you to a group of companies that are worth talking to, but I don't think that you can fairly consider these to be like the rankings of like the best of the best. Uh, and starting with, for example, the keyword difficulty. So if I plug each and every one of those keywords into a keyword difficulty scale, what I find is that almost half of them are at like extremely low volume. So, you know, it's kind of one man's trash is another man's treasure like ranking for immigration lawyer in Philadelphia or personal injury lawyer in Los Angeles is vastly, vastly different than ranking for those same terms in a lower population state, even if it's even a capital city. Like, for example, ranking in Tallahassee, Florida, you know, is very easy, even for very difficult keywords like trucking wrecks or personal injury or immigration, uh, because it's a smaller it's a smaller city, it's a smaller community, and the, the volume is just not there either because of their tort reform efforts or for other reasons I don't understand. And I'm not going to get into any of that. But what I am saying is that by doing this analysis, we can drill down and figure out, okay, who was actually pulling in uh, keywords that were difficult? Um, and on this chart right here, keyword difficulty is the KD, volume uh, is like the number of searches each month. And there's two other metrics here that are really neat. Uh, and that's the CPC. So this is this is global search fund, but I want to show you CPC. So CPC is the cost per click. If instead of doing organic search work, you were to just pay for every lead. So for if, instead of going to your website, you could just pay four dollars 
and get someone to come to your website or pay $90 in the case of personal injury lawyer, Las Vegas. And that's what we're going to be using to figure out as a very important metric to like how difficult uh, are these keywords and what's the real value that they're bringing. Uh, and here's kind of the, the top and the bottom of that list. So personal injury lawyer, Houston, 71 difficulty. Personal injury lawyer, Hoover, Alabama, zero. Like you want to be the king of Hoover, Alabama, you can do that tomorrow. Just throw it up on your website. You will rank. Atlanta falls kind of near the top like this. Don't I don't look at 50 and call it the middle like 50 is hard, like extremely hard. And you can see that by looking at the overall difficulty across the board for these terms in these cities. So only 10 of the keywords on our list got up into the 90 range. Uh, and the vast majority of them were in the 10 to zero range, excuse me, the 20 to zero. So that doesn't necessarily make them hard or easy uh, because you also have to keep in mind that there are other people who are at least putting an effort for those keywords that are even at 20. Uh, but the ones at nine and zero, like those are kind of low hanging fruit, but the same thing applies here where like they're low hanging fruit because no one wants them because those people aren't looking for that service in that community. Uh, what I did with this data on the keyword difficulty and the individual domains that ranked for each and every one of those keywords is I came up with a weighted scoring system, which was essentially if you ranked your website for at number one at a high keyword difficulty and high traffic page, you get more points. But if you ranked number 10 on a low difficulty, low volume keyword, you got less points. And so I just weighted them, I just added weights uh, to like, you get more points for doing well for a high traffic domain or a, I mean a high traffic keyword or a high difficulty keyword. And that data came out to having, uh, you know, pretty good striation. Um, and let me, I'll pull this back to the top and go a little bit slower. Uh, so at the top here was law rank, benchmark, Growth Lab SEO, uh, Manka Tao Web Design, CJ Anderson, make it smaller for you. CJ Anderson, Go Black Vent, On the Map, Juris Digital, Speakeasy. And so you can look at this and say, okay, well, Law Rank is here at the top. They've done it 135 times. They got a very high score for doing it. Uh, like, does that make them number one? Uh, and the answer is like, maybe, maybe not. And the reason why you, it could be maybe not is you then have to look at like how frequently they obtain those results or similar for other clients. Like if you're throwing 40, you know, SEO hooks in the water and all 40 of them are hitting the bullseye, hire that company. But if you're a company that is, has thousands of clients and hundreds just happen to be number one, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's a company that you should work with. Like it's kind of like the blind squirrel finds a nut, you know, every now and then. And that's what I would say has probably happened with some of the larger volume SEO companies. So what I'm looking for when I'm trying to pick like, who am I going to interview? Who am I going to talk with? Is I'm looking at like relatively low number of clients and consistently high results. So when we look at how often, they're pulling those results for multiple domains. Uh, we get a kind of a little bit of a different look here. Uh, so law rank, uh, benchmark, sorry, this is the same one as before. It's just truncated. Um, what I did next though, was I pulled every website that I could find for each and every marketing company. And I did that by then going to the marketing company's website and then finding their backlinks. So the same way I went to like the, top 10 ranking pages for each keyword. And then I went and pulled the, the outbound link to the SEO company. I then went to each and every SEO company, all 608 and pulled at each and every inbound backlink. And I matched it up with uh, lawyer SEO company, I mean, some law firm websites. And from there, I then looked at the domain rating of each and every one of them. I looked at how many links they had. I looked at the traffic that they have, and I looked at how many keywords that they rank for. 
And because the idea being that I don't want to just have cherry pick results that were in the top 10. I wanted to know like, what are you going to do for the guy who hires you from like square one and how quickly are you able to get results and how consistently are you able to get results? So here's what that data looks like. Uh, and this is just an example of like matching this up. So like as these websites come in, I pull the metadata and say like, yes, this is a personal injury lawyer. I matched it up with the website company. Um, and then I determined how many keywords that were in the top 10 across the board, not just like my difficult keywords, but like across the board, how many keywords did you rank for in the top 10? And I did that for each and every domain. Um, and as you keep going down that list, a couple of things start to stand out. And this is kind of where this is then where my data led me. And what I did was I applied a cutoff of a minimum of 20 clients. I then combined the scores for how well they did for those websites that were ranking for very competitive keywords. I then also applied a metric for how well they were ranking for their average client. And I weighted those two together. And a couple of things will stand out from this list, like one of which being Justia having, you know, 1400 top 10 instances, but delivering an average value for their clients of 20. Like what that tells me is that they've got some like superstar websites, but maybe the average lawyer website isn't getting that full benefit. Uh, and I can say the same thing for uh, Matador or iLawyer or FirmSeek. And those guys will, may dispute that and fairly, because I, I mean, you're, you're at some point, you're just kind of making data up and determining what the weighting is and like what weights you apply and what factors you think are important or not. Uh, but for me, I wanted to be able to come and deliver some sort of evaluation of who is consistently knocking it out of the park for their best clients and doing a very good job for their uh, their average client. And I really want to stress here that uh, just because someone is near the bottom of this list doesn't mean they're a bad company. And the reason I say that is because this is the top 7% of all SEO companies in the country. Like this is the cream of the crop. And each and every domain uh, marketing company on here has achieved greatness for somebody. And I can pull any of these people. I'll go to Advantage Attorney Marketing, which is the bottom but like really they're just like extremely high on the list of seo companies and i don't mean this the fact that they're 30 versus one to be a slight at all because it's not and so advantage and i can pull out one of their websites and huntsville defense lawyer like huntsville defense lawyer they're managing to bring in a domain rating of 28 they rank for 21,000 keywords with an average keyword difficulty somewhere around seven. And they're doing that uh, in Alabama and they're bringing in $9,000 worth of, if they were to replace it with pay-per-click value every month. Like that's incredible. Like if you can get that result, you take that every single day. And so here's the question, like what do you do with this list? The answer is that uh, you go to Go to the website. I'll email the link once I get this up, the current list updated and on the website. And you can see all the data for yourself and sort it however you want. And I would start to look at these companies and I would look at their representative clients and I would want to know, like, does that fit the aesthetic that I like? Do I do I like what they're doing? Do I like their sales rep? And do I are they answering the magic questions right? And we'll talk about the magic questions in a second. Uh, and See if you can find like a good fit where like they like you uh, and you like them and you guys are going to be able to work together. So how do you do that? So there's 10 questions that you just that you have to ask. And I've, I've vetted these questions with several SEO companies and most of them say, I don't like being asked these questions, but these are the good questions to ask. Uh, and so I view that as kind of a sign of this is something that is worth listening to. Uh, so the number one question is like, who's responsible for my website? Like, 
it, am I going to be passed off to a new guy who just got there and is a college graduate and, you know, has no SEO experience? I'm going to be placed with a, you know, senior SEO representative and he's going to be one share of me through it. Or am I with the actual founder of the company and it's a smaller agency? Like understanding who's doing the day to day work, I think, is very important. And I'll give you a practical example here from Growth Lab SEO. Here's what they say. So uh, first, can you introduce yourself and tell us, like, what is it that you guys are doing that you think is special? Yeah. Hey, Matt. So my name is Will Palmer. I founded Growth Lab just a few years ago after working for one of the larger legal marketing firms. And we just knew there was likely a better way to approach the problem with SEO, which is, in my opinion, people don't know what they're paying for and what they're getting every month. And it's a lot of these jargony big terms that are thrown around and no one really understands where the rubber meets the road. So here's what I think is unique about our approach. And that I think you, if you're a law firm, you can kind of look for and ask for number one, the people that are actually tactically doing the SEO work, what we call our SEO legal SEO strategists, they're the account managers. Uh, they're the ones that are actually face to face with clients. We aren't outsourcing all the SEO work overseas or to have better margins with strategic partners. They're actually building the, the 12 month strategy roadmap, doing the keyword research, understanding what content is missing, looking at the website and auditing it for just basic SEO mistakes. And they're actually doing the work, clicking the mouse, clicking the keys. Um, so your account manager is not reporting on a team unknown behind them. They're doing the work. So I think the transparency that comes from that is huge. And then our approach to content just with AI and, and all of the things that have evolved has, has evolved with it. And so unlike a lot of options out there where you're going to get a number of posts per month, let's say like four blog posts a month or, or whatever it is, articles, all we right, actually so care more about what's you're that? doing. So you're not doing that. Like, cause that's what I see mm -hmm. the most. Like, what I'll see is like, we're going to give you, you know, five, 10, 15 blog posts a month. And then it's up to you to like, decide what's going to go. You're not doing that. What are you doing instead? No, because if you look at the algorithm in the EEAT experience, expertise, authority, trust, and you actually use AI, not just to write content, even though we do use AI to assist with content writing, it's kind of a human hybrid approach, but we actually go on word count. So if you look at some of the AI tools out there and you sort of take a keyword like you've done, Matt, and say, what are the top 10 search results for this head term keyword in this Metro? And you were to say, let me analyze these 10 websites showing up on, on page one of search. You know, what's the word count? What's the keywords? What's the keyword frequency, headers, paragraph count, image count? I mean, all of these things. And you say, what is the roadmap? If I'm trying to rank at the top for that keyword, how many words do I need? It could be a thousand. It could be 3,500 based on AI and based on data. So we actually say to a client, hey, we'll give you... 10, 20, 30,000 words a month, we don't guarantee a certain number of pages that come from that because we're relying on Google to say, for this page to be successful, it needs to be this long. And it's not about word count, that's just one factor in an equation that has many factors and variables, but it's a baseline. I mean, you have to leverage data to actually be smarter and outwork your comp competition, not just check a bunch of boxes on social media and blog posting and your headers and H1s and all these different tactical things that just check every box and say, hey, I've got a team doing it. You have to, it's just too competitive and legal to, to take that approach in our opinion. So we go off of like bulk word count and then it's at our SEO strategist discretion to say, hey, you're, if you want you know, car accidents in Houston or family law in Columbus, Ohio, here's where the gaps are with content. Let's fill it and prioritize it that way. Does that make sense? No, not at all. Like I have, like, that sounds like a bunch of like big SEO stuff. Like if I were to okay. like break it down, is it essentially what you're telling me is that instead of saying, Hey, we're going to do a number of blog artists. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to look at your competitive landscape and we're going to say, Hey, this person is got X amount of content. And in order for you to outpace them or outrank them, you're going to have to hit this pace. And then you guys do that. Is that fair? It's half fair. If you're trying to rank, if you're trying to get more drug cases and you know what terms that have high intent for a need for an attorney in your metro are, that's what the keyword research is showing. Here's what people type into search to find an attorney. And you look at who's ranking number one for that search term. 
what does their practice area page content look like in terms of all those things like word count look like? And then what do we need to do to, to benchmark and then beat those metrics for that piece of content? So when I say, hey, you got 10,000 words a month, that could be four to seven or eight actual website pages that come from us determined purely on the competitiveness of that keyword in the market, period. Is that clarify yeah. it at all? Yes, and also these pics are like ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't paying attention, but I see the aggressive nature of feeding happening. This is yeah. this is good, Matt. It's memorable. I love it. Yeah. Okay. So then, can you talk to me a little bit also about like what would a a law firm because you guys don't have like hundreds of clients. Like, if I'm like if you're trying to like give me your ideal profile of a law firm, like what's the ideal profile of a person that should call you guys? Okay. So most of our clients, if I'm just being candid either have been burned or spending a lot of money with an SEO provider, you know, you all have a lot of different philosophies. Literally all, that's all of us. That's literally every one of us. <laughs> it, it's, I've been, okay, so I've been working with law firms for a decade, 10 years now. Um, there's a lot of different philosophies and a lot of different ways people are being told to generate clients. But I'm looking for somebody that is actually somewhat savvy with it and that actually can sort of i mean in a perfect world detect bs because there's just it, it there's just unfortunately a lot of it out there that's one of the reasons i started the company there's a lack of transparency a lot of bs a lot of just tapping into the stuff people don't understand so if you have some savviness to you and you have a budget and you want to dominate and you want to be a market leader those are kind of our best fit clients frankly because they're willing to kind of push the envelope try new things try new technologies to to be different so. Okay. Excellent. All right. Well, Will, thank you very much for plugging. Is there anything else you want to add before I jump back into the data? No, I just think encouraging your your people that are listening to do due diligence on who they're talking to is a really smart idea and something I encourage as well. So appreciate the uh, the data you provided. Absolutely. Uh, Second. You want to know how many people is that guy or that team responsible for? Like, because it's one thing to be like, Matt, you're getting a team of 10 SEO specialists. Well, how many other websites are they responsible for? Well, 400. Like, you just start doing math at that point. Or if they tell you eight and it's one guy, just do the math. How many hours in a month does he have? And how many can he possibly spend on your website? Or are they saying that they're going to shortchange their other clients? Like, these are the questions that you want to ask to get to the bottom of like, what can I realistically expect? What is your bandwidth for working on my case? You also want to ask how much time you can get them to commit to on your website. Like people will say, oh, we will give you blog content or we will give you articles like that's good. But what you really want is like how many is how many hours will you commit in writing to put on advancing my website regardless of what it is whether it's blogs or on-page optimization like i want something in writing that says i'm going to get a minimum of x hours every week or every month and that's going to depend on your budget and your keyword difficulty if i'm in atlanta frankly i'm wanting 20 to 30 hours a week from somebody to be able to like keep pushing me up on personal injury if i'm doing you know lower keyword difficulty things I might be fine with a meeting once a month just to like check in and tweak some stuff. And but you're going to want to make sure that your budget reflects where you are on that scale. And the only way you can do that is by doing some of that baseline keyword research that I showed you. The next thing you want to ask is like, how much content are you going to produce for me? And I don't mean articles. I mean, like words, like how many words am I getting every month and how are you creating it? Are you just spinning something through GPT? Or are you doing something that's by hand? Are you paying somebody? Am I responsible for the content? Do I have to edit all of the content? These are the questions that you have to ask to just walk yourself through it. Uh, finally, you want to ask, like, what's the process, the process for getting backlinks on my website? Like, and that includes paid directory listings. Like, are you paying for directory listings? If I want to, you know, use Bright Local or some other tool, are you doing that? Am I responsible for that? And then you also then want to ask, like, are you what's the page speed that you're providing? Like, am I gonna are you gonna guarantee a minimum page speed of 95? Are you gonna guarantee a minimum page speed on of that on desktop and mobile? And if you care about geographic exclusivity, which I don't, but I know a lot of people do, you want to get that in writing as well and understand the limits. 
because a lot of companies will say that they offer uh, geographic exclusivity, but it may only be for like three practice areas. And if someone says, well, I also do dog bites, well, the next thing you know, they're going to be using that client as well. You want to get that in writing if you care about it. And then finally, you want to figure out, is there a minimum contract length or a contract at all? Uh, most people do want you to sign a one-year contract, but there are companies out there that don't. So we've made it to like the happy hour part of this. I've like finagled uh, to get Julian, Bruce, Mike, and Michael Ferringer here. Uh, and I can let you guys can introduce yourselves or I can do it for you, but I, I think that would rather just, you know, kick us off, Julian. Hi there, everybody. My name is Julian Gomez. I'm a uh, automotive product liability lawyer in South Texas. And uh, thank you, Matt, for including me. Uh, I'm not quite sure what I did to deserve to be here other than be your friend. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's about all it takes sometimes. Uh, Bruce, tell us about yourself. Hi, I'm Bruce Miller. I'm a uh, personal injury lawyer in Atlanta. I've been doing this about 30 years. I've known Matt a long time, probably about 15 years. Um, and uh, I'm just glad that he invited me. He loves to talk about... Uh, this SEO stuff and we kick it around from time to time. And I'm hopefully I can uh, add something today that adds some value to somebody helps them out. Yeah, absolutely. And Mikey. Hey, I'm Mike Malonkis. Uh, I own a firm here in Greenville, South Carolina. I practiced in Atlanta for 10 years before opening up a shop here in my wife's hometown five years ago. And, um, you know, I'm just doing, regular old personal injury law and uh, just having fun running my own business and trying this, trying that, trying to get better. It's kind of like Maddie was saying and uh, happy to be here to talk. Absolutely. And Mr. Mr. Farringer. Uh, Mike Farringer. Um, I've been doing SEO for gosh, about 20 years or so now. Um, starting out just doing small websites as a personal hobby and uh, grew into a business and uh, eventually got to where I was doing it in the corporate world. I've been working for uh, Ring Central as their senior web optimization manager, uh, managing uh, the whole search engine operation and uh, AI as far as it relates to chat bots. Um, met Matt online about six months ago and he referred me to Julian and here we are. <laughs> All right. So like, I'll kind of kick off like the, the big question of like, why does it always feel like I'm just getting taken for a ride? Like no matter who I hire, no matter what due diligence I do, like whatever I do, I just feel like I'm just getting tricked. Like, am I alone in this or do you guys feel this way too? And I'm going to pour my drink while you answer yeah. that question. <laughs> well, look, I'll fall on the sword first. Um, there's no doubt that, uh, I bet I've talked to maybe 30 or 40, maybe more than that marketing companies uh, since I made the decision to try and market other than relationship marketing. And uh, there's no doubt that I feel that I have spoken with people and been presented with uh, proposals that appear to take advantage of my lack of knowledge of how a website works, how SEO works, and really how basic marketing even works. And I'm a good lawyer, uh, but I may not be the best marketer. And I see that that's something that uh, people have tried to take advantage of before in the past. And like, Bruce, you don't use yeah. a company, right? That's, that's right. I, you know, just a little bit of background. I got into doing the, uh, you know, optimizing our site and, and working with an individual back in 2007. And I was with him for a couple of years and we did, we did really well. And then I, uh, he left to uh, go to an agency. And so I switched over to an agency. And I think what Matt was talking about is, do we feel like we're, we're being taken advantage of? And when you're with an agency, it's kind of like our clients with us, you know, you're, you're going to have mixed mixed results. Some agencies are going to spend a lot of time working on your, your website and some of them are spread a little too thin. And my experience with agencies was, was mixed. We had some really great results. And at times uh, I felt like they weren't very responsive. It took a long time. If I wanted something real simple, change like a picture it might take 
you know, it could take one day, one time it could take two or three days. The next time it might take a month. And I got kind of frustrated with that. And so eventually I brought it all in house. And right now we have, I've got a full time, um, webmaster and, um, but he can't do it all himself. You, what we found out is you can't just hire like one guy and say, Oh, well, I've got a guy who's working, you know, works all these hours for me. Well, he's going to work those hours, but he can't do it all. So you have to, you have to hire somebody. You have to find somebody who works with well with contractors and well with, with agencies are going to fill in those things. Um, so you have to, it takes a, a while to develop that. We, we hired the guy that I ended up, settling on, we went through two or three people. I ended up hiring someone who was a former account manager at one of the SEO agencies. And that was, I think that was the key. Did you have any like contract problems with that? Uh, no, because we didn't hire somebody away from an agency. He had gone to another job. I uh, was actually working for a bank for a few years. Okay. Um, and um, so I was able to hire, I hired him away from a bank actually. That's a Okay. Robbing the bank. I like that. And Mikey, you're like, you're yeah. one of the top rated companies and like, like, are you having a different experience? No, it's, it's, it's been a, it's been a really good experience. Um, when I first opened up, I had one company that did the website. You know, they had all kinds of various promises. If the website is this, then we're going to, you're going to kill it. And then after about, you know, a year, I'm like, this isn't killing it. Went to another company who did get us some results um but it just it didn't seem to have a way of like really improving what what it was delivering like on a monthly basis um so then switch companies again and they, they've been good they i like that they aren't just like here's your impressions for the month Here's the impressions. This is up 1% from last month's impressions. Um, so I get a little bit more inside baseball from them. A you know, not too far in because eventually I just don't under, I don't want to understand um, because, you know, we're just busy and we have all these other aspects of our life and our practice that, you know, we should be focusing on if, if we have somebody that's doing a decent job and doing a good job and says they're the experts in it. Um, so that's been good. I think kind of the struggle for me is and this is I, seems to be with any of like decent marketing agencies they're like okay here's how much it's going to be a month uh and here's what we're going to deliver and then even if you're happy with it it's like everybody wants to upsell you eventually and so that's where i kind of you know struggle a little bit just generally is with any kind of company that's trying to upsell you um not that it's wrong like they're they're probably right like there's other examples of other you know clients that they have that these things have worked for them. So I think that might just be a trust issue on my end as kind of a newer business owner um, to be like, all right, let's, let's go take this other jump. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm a little more risk averse than I know, let's say Weatherington is. So I do a little bit more hand wringing, um, but I know I had to make some other decisions uh, along the way. Um, I don't know if that answers the question, but it takes, well, I mean, like, I was younger than I mean, this looks like an upsell to me. Like, this looks like you got a video of birds and waterfalls. Uh, like, do you, like, how did this come about? Well, this is, I mean, should, I, mean I don't know, do I name names? Like, this is a very large yeah, video. There's not, I mean, is this a crisp like, video? Yeah, it's a crisp video. Um, so it's it's good. And, and, like, I had a really good client, you know, and, and you know, I have a little bit of, storytelling backgrounds or, you know, acting backgrounds. So I think I, I think I came across pretty well and pretty authentic, which, um, oh, I can, I can, the video is nice, have, but... like, like this video is like incredible. Like, and this is the truth of every Chris video. Like, I don't know that I've ever seen a Chris video that I thought was like poorly done. Like where right. I kind of question it is whether the value is there or not. And that I don't know the answer to. Um, and I'm scared and to like, spend hard. well, what, when I heard Mike, he talked about impressions, right? They go a little bit beyond impressions. Like, respectfully, like, a lot of impressions could be fake, right? Mm -hmm. Just because, like, I swear I have more marketers or vendors reaching out to me than 
clients or potential clients, right? It, it's there are people that, uh, True. I, right? I, I did some some keyword research yesterday or the day before, and it was really interesting the way how words were put in. It was like car accident attorney, and there was people that are typing in right. That's uh, or personal injury attorney, right? But like injury attorney hurt right that's not a marketer that's like a human being that's actually hurt looking for a lawyer and there's there's different thing is, is impressions i think the metrics that a lot of these companies are using do not necessarily correlate with a, what an actual human being that is really truly out seeking them right. right yeah the intent and, and they right they can they can bait and switch you and it looks really good right like oh you had a thousand people come to your website but I didn't get a client. So what good is a thousand people coming to my website? Does that mean that I've got a conversion problem, um, uh, like a messaging problem, or does that mean that I really had a, th a thousand fake people out there looking at me? Um, yeah. And, and, that, the, the, the and that's key, beyond my scope. Yeah, the, the key is, try, is measuring the um, results that you're getting. And it's, it's a difficult thing to do because people will just say, Google. I found you on I found you on Google. So how do you really know? Um, and uh, so it's very you know it takes a lot of uh, effort to actually figure out if you're um, you're being found as a result of what the SEO company is doing for you, or if they're searching for your name, or they're or if they're they're clicking on an ad or YouTube video. So you, you have to track all of that, and even that is imprecise. Um, so, you know, it's for, for us, we're looking at um, not necessarily uh, a, a particular data set. We're looking at the big at the big picture. If our overall impressions, I mean, I mean I'm sorry, our overall leads in a month are this much and we're getting the kind of cases we want. And I think you get a general sense for um, whether your marketing is working, because we all know when it's a former client that. Um, yep. contacted us. We all know, Julian, you know, when, you know, you're doing auto products, Ooh, so yeah. you're getting referrals from, um, Julian, sorry, you're, you're getting, I'm um, looking at your name. I'm just reading it up. So, but you're, you, you're getting referrals from attorneys. I would imagine that know, know that that's what you do. They, they're guys like, uh, like me and Mike that might have a general personal injury practice and, one of our clients has a has a brain injury because the airbag didn't deploy or maybe it was overly aggressive and we're we don't do that so we're going to call you and you know those so you can you can look at those you can just push those aside well i got this many referrals this month from from my attorneys well where did the rest of them come from you're never going to know for sure and your your seo company you got to evaluate them as to what is the overall volume of leads that i'm getting from those other sources because people are going to go to your website when they hear about you they're going to go there um if they you know just to check you out it's what we all do it i mean when you go to another town you go to a city on uh you go to take a deposition you're going to go to miami take a deposition someone says well let's let's go out to you know um Falano's restaurant well you're going to check it out online before you go right so people are people are going there they're going to your website even if they've heard of you, but you can sort out the ones that you know came from another attorney pretty easily. Yeah. Well, like Bruce, what I think, what, what, ahead, what, go what go I was saying, are you counting leads or are you counting clients? We track everything. We track every lead. We try to figure out where each one came from, but we know as a, you know, we know that it's going to be imperfect. We know that, you know, we might, um, have a, uh, you know, a Google AdWords campaign running, but, and somebody is, but the people are just going to say Google and we can see how many clicks we got, but we don't really know if it, right. if it came from that, that AdWord or not. I mean, what we do is we will track. So we track every lead that comes in from any source. And then like part of our intake of like the very first phone call is like, how did you find out about us? And then like drill down kind of as well as you can. And Almost never is the word Google for us. Like 99.9% .9 of the time, it's because either a former client or an attorney 
or, or there was a news story about something we're doing on, but like almost never is it like, hey, I found you on Google. And even when they do find us on Google, I, I think a majority of the time it's because of those other activities. And so like one of the things that I really question, because it's so, this is like the ironic part of like me putting on an SDO seminar is that like, I'm not certain that this is like the best, highest and best use of my marketing dollars. Because like Bruce, I know for example, that like you do a lot of like school like involvement stuff and community engagement where you have events that are in the community you're giving away things to schools and things like i suspect and i could be wrong but i suspect that that is returning a much higher return on investment for you than seo with maybe one or two exceptions and the question becomes like are those two exceptions worth all of the hassle you know it's a it's a question i ask myself from time to time because you do spend a lot of time um, and we all spend, if whether we're doing it in-house or we have an agency, we're spending a lot of money on it. And the leads that come from, the random leads that come from the internet, you know, on average are going to be not probably not as good as the efforts that you make through your own networking. But that takes time as well. Yeah. Our, our time is valuable. And if you're, you know, if you're spending, I mean, what, another way of looking at it and I don't know what you, I'm not, I'm not advocating for one way or, or, or another, but what's the most expensive marketing that you have? Uh, I bought uh, you know? to the Hawks for a season and I got zero referrals out of it. <laughs> no, it's not that. I, I would, I would say, what's the largest referral check you've ever written to someone? Oh, millions. <laughs> well, yeah. there you go. That's some pretty expensive right. marketing. That's, that's fair. Um, but I don't, I don't really put that in the marketing category. I mean, that to me is, I don't know. What I, you... I, I, I have a very good friend that that's how he counts marketing dollars. He, so the, if he refers a case out, and I'm going to use easy numbers. If 50% of that is paid to somebody else that works up the case for him or something, he sees that as his cost of acquisition. Like well, his, that's, that's his return on but that's an right. outbound referral. I'm talking. I, I think Bruce is talking about inbound referrals. So, but it's the same. It's it, it, it's the, the same, same point. Same. Uh, I'm not saying. I'm not saying that one, doing it one way versus another is right or wrong. I do. It, I do both, and I'm sure most people do. I, I value my relationships with other attorneys. I take plenty of people out. We buy a lot of lunches, a lot of, yeah. you know, tickets to events for attorneys and gifts. But we, you know you recognize that, you know, you refer, you're paying a referral fee. Somebody sends you a case, you might be sending them a check for a hundred thousand to a million dollars. That's uh, more than a lot of our marketing budgets. So, you know, just keep that in mind that there, you know, there, the whole picture has to be looked at. And if you can make it without advertising at all, just on referrals, that that's great. Um, just recognize you're also going to spend, spend time doing that. Well, I mean, I can tell you that like in the career, my entire legal career, like dollar for dollar, the single best money and time I ever spent was when I was a couple of years out of practice, out of law school. And I just decided to email every single lawyer in the trial bar because I'm a you know, plaintiff's lawyer. And I asked every single one of them out to lunch. I would say I had probably four lunches a week for over a year. I probably paid for less than half of those lunches because the, uh, the 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 kind people on the other side of the table were wanted to help me, and then they did. I mean, in fact, that's Bruce. That's probably how I met you, um, or at least developed the relationship. And like that, to me, like, and that has continued to pay off dividends, not just financially, but like socially, professionally, and like just as a human being right. from forever. Right. So going back to your original point, you know, you're wondering if you are, you know, by investing in an SEO company, you feel like you're, you're getting taken advantage of, you know, you have to measure that, you know, return on investment the same way you would measure, you know, your relationships with other people. And if you don't need to invest in an SEO company, I'd say maybe, maybe you don't do it um, because it requires an ongoing effort by the SEO company to constantly maintain your site. They have to be performing work all the time. It's like a, 
you know, an ongo- it's a competition. Everybody's trying to leapfrog each other in the results. And so if they're good at it, they're only good at it because they're constantly, um, you know, optimizing your site and looking at the competition. It's, that's just one way to compete. Another way to compete is what you did, Matt, which is go out there and, and network with everyone. And uh, I say, I say do both. I mean, I think that's the way, that's one of the keys to, to success. Well, I, I, two things that I'd like to contribute to this, going back to Bruce, going back to the original thing. Well, why do we feel like maybe you've been taken advantage of? Well, one of them is that it, the, the the perception from some people is that as lawyers, as plaintiff's lawyers versus hourly lawyers, right, is that we just hit this jackpot of money, right? Like we hit this, this giant treasure at the end of some fixed period of time and, and they prey upon that, right? As opposed to steady money every month coming in and, and those like, look, uh, this doesn't necessarily cash flow, but you get one big 18 wheeler case and this pays for two or three years of that kind of stuff. And, 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 and they'll prey on that optimism that is naturally inherent in us as as contingency fee attorneys that are willing to invest in those cases. And then another problem is that it's not like, let's say, a divorce attorney or a criminal deter- attorney is that we put money into SEO and if we're lucky, we get a case from that in a month or two, but we don't see revenue from that in my in three years. Yes. In a regular car wreck, best case scenario, that's probably like six months. And so, it, right. you know, if you're a, a mass tort lawyer, you know, what is that, five years? I mean, yeah. like, like so. So Ferenger, you you're on the opposite side of this where like you hear are completely unreasonable expectations and demands. Like, where are we going wrong here? Every turn. It's not that hard. Just put number one lawyer in the title and then we you get it, right? Oh, uh, it's that easy, right? Uh, this is interesting listening to everything from your guys' angle. Um, but I I do think there's a lot of BS going on out there too. Like Bruce, you were saying, um, anybody can be at the top of SEO, but it's an ongoing battle. Once you start getting into the game of building more content, building more backlinks, it, it's just back and forth, back and forth. Who has the manpower to keep putting in all of that stuff? Um, so my my point of view is I try not to get into all the like um, all that nickel and dime back and forth stuff with all the companies. I really focus more on just the 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 tried and true basic SEO fundamentals making sure that your your site is quality um bigger isn't necessarily better although more content can <laughs> help what you nothing about me that's special though how are you going to make me a person cases any different than bruce miller the trial lawyer who wants admitted liability catastrophic yeah. trucking wreck case separate party mm-hmm. you know like, maybe yeah, yeah yeah while on video we want him live streaming the wreck too like <laughs> watch me do this math yeah like like, I mean, short of that, like how, like, I don't think that like having a good, you know, good site and telling your story is kind of like, like that's the closing, but like getting the people in the door, I think is the hard part. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it's tough. I think the marketing dollars could be different for everybody. I think probably the, from everything that I've seen, the biggest ROI is from referrals, like really. Um, but your website is kind of the closer. If you have a quality website that's easy to navigate, it's easy to find what you're looking for. Um, that, in my opinion, is one of the number one things. It's putting together a quality website. It's easy to navigate, easy to find what you're looking for. So it sounds like what I'm really hearing here is like have a brochure website and then spend your money, you know, on community app, community events. I wouldn't disagree with that. Um, <laughs> I really like you look at like like you were showing earlier when I first jumped on, you were flipping through all those websites. And I looked at hundreds of attorney websites when I met um, you and Julian. And they are. They're very similar. Everybody's copying everybody. I don't know if everybody's using the same few handful of design firms, but they're all so similar. Um, uh, One of the things that I try to focus on when I'm doing an SEO um, project is trying to anticipate what the users are searching for. 
like um, try to try to understand like what their questions are going to be, and those questions should be built into your website. It should be like the Q and A type um, pages, and th those are the things that are going to bring in the customers. Um, like Huli and you were saying, you don't you can kind of figure out the difference between a marketer searching for you and a real customer. You need to figure out the phrases that the real customers are using. Um, and that's going to bring in the, the people that you want. Yeah. I've got my, I've got my, my little video here of, uh, and I'll just, I'm going to keep speeding it up just cause there's, I mean, it's six and a half hours. I'm going to put this up on YouTube so people can like browse through it themselves. I mean, but like very quickly, like these things start to look, very similar. I can stop it anywhere. And you're like, oh yeah, I think I've seen that before. Bell bonds, that's a little different. Uh, like more bell bonds. I've been surprised at how like effective bell bond SEO companies are at breaking into criminal law stuff. Like, like that seemed like one of the big insights for me. Um, but like all of these websites, I mean, like what makes you different? You know, I am, let's find one. Uh, Communities, clients, and people. I mean, like, seen that, like, American immigration law. They make running my business easier. And like, I, what I think a lot of these marketing people do as well is they come in and they say, like, no, 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 you are special. We just got to spend the time and energy to deep dive into, like, what makes the Gomez firm tick? How is it that you have, tell your personal story? and resonate with your clients. And like, the reality is that I don't know that I've, I can get on one hand, the number of lawyers I've met on both the defense or the plaintiff side who I thought were just like garbage human beings. And the vast majority of lawyers that I meet are good, decent, hardworking people who, if you get to know them even a little bit, you're like, oh yeah, I wanna work with that person. And that's the marketers kind of prey on that because it's just universally true that like everyone has a really compelling, interesting story to tell, but I don't really understand how that fully translates into, yes, this is how you get your SEO up and running so that you're getting leads that otherwise would have no interest in you. Uh, and, and that's what I struggle with. Right. I think it's, I think it's really a two pronged approach, which, you know, going back to like the video we have, um like i sent out a, a poll to our current and former clients probably in december or so but, you know maybe 10 percent, 20 percent responded and from there you know i was like hey did you ever see it's like did you ever see our video on facebook you know 10 percent responded you know yes out of that and then i was like did you see it before you called us or after and like you know a bunch of them were said after uh so like from that little data set that I had, I was like, well, obviously it wasn't that many people calling because of it, but I could tell, you know, a couple of times it was good cases where, um, some, for some reason it's stuck in somebody's head enough. You know, obviously I, I bet TV would probably be, yeah, better, a better way to do it. But I also think people are going to get way too many. It's just a whole different, it's a whole different game of TV, I think. But, um, let's see here the good thing about video is also they take out the fact that you're super ADD and sometimes lose track of your thoughts um but so you have a video but it's like well how do people see it and like in it, it you know basically uh my wife is mortified but like we walk around our smaller town than Atlanta or, or Houston or whatever and you know people are like oh yeah I saw your, you know, saw your video on Facebook like at least they know what I do now like before that, they just might be like, um, so I think that there might be useful. Can I quantify it? No. I just know that people will tell me, yeah, we've seen you there. And my wife thinks that she's getting dirty looks from strangers in public who she believes realize that they've seen us. Uh, I will tell you a very prescient point. And that is that like, I have been shocked consistently at how few of my friends and extended family members have any idea what I do. Um, and no matter how many times I post about verdicts or results or causes that I'm advocating for on Facebook or social media, like if you were to ask them point blank, Hey, what do I do? You're a lawyer. No idea. And I see the post, like one of the like, first steps that a lot of the like business coaches will do is have you like introduce yourself to like your community again and like be like, 
my name is Matt and I'm a personal injury lawyer in Atlanta. And I have noticed that when people do that, the comment section, at least on those posts, and, as I, and, I, and I follow up with them as well, because this is something I've been kind of studying, like they all say like, I got a bunch of, you know, I got, you know, new referral sources or I got stuff from that. And so like, I just feel like I should just go online now and like every other week be like, by the way, I still do personal injury cases uh, because I'm just yelling into a void at some point where like no one is actually listening until they're in the market. Right. It's kind of like, you know, if you have, we all have friends who are real estate agents and then, I mean, we, if, if we're kind of hard on ourselves about our marketing and thinking it's hokey or whatever, I mean, geez, like real estate agents, like every day, like, we're so thrilled about this house. They're like, look at this house. They're like, that's not the house to be thrilled about. You know? But, yeah, and then they have super nice ones too. And it's just like every day they're telling every, like they're telling everybody in the press, I'm a real estate agent. I'm a real estate agent. And, you know, no one holds it against them. They don't hold it against themselves. Um, yeah. You know, so I think some of that's just kind of like, if you want to be over that hump or that thing about telling people what you do and what you what you really like, um, you know, uh, yeah, I, I, I have like, no, like I have no ill will towards anyone who like tells me what they do and is like I want to sell this house. Like I, and I, again, do you guys? I mean, like if you you when you see like a real estate agent or someone that's like selling their businesses and stuff, like do you like have any animosity towards them? Uh, like, cause we all perceive that people are going to have that animosity towards us, but like, right. It's just not there. Right. Is that, that's, I think kind of my point is like, no one, I don't think the real estate agents think like, oh, everyone's like, oh gosh, I can't believe you're doing this again. But we, we think that way. I think sometimes I, I will shut them out. Right. I, like, like if I keep hear the same thing over and over and over, like, I know what you are. I, I just don't want to see it. I'm more interested in your personal life uh, or who you are as a human being than to hear that you have another house for sale, right? Like I, I'm not in the market for a house, so I shut it off. And I've gotten one case from social media, one. Um, and, and I don't know, let's say I've had an Instagram for, or a Facebook for five, 10 years. Um, I, I, I don't think that anyone pays attention to me uh, because they're like, wow, this guy's so interesting and he talks about the law. They'd rather see me walking with my wife and my dog. Like, that's what they like more. I mean, that's what the views show, right? Like if oh, I yeah. say, I'm speaking, so like I'm gonna speak on Friday morning, for example, uh, to the Massachusetts Trial Lawyers Association or whatever the heck they're called, is I'm gonna talk to them and I'm going to put out there tomorrow, hey, speaking to the Massachusetts Trial Lawyers Association, and like 10 people are going to give anything about it. Nobody else cares about it. And I'll probably lose people that were following, that were interested in watching me walk with my dog or cook dinner or you know, like the most, literally the most viewed thing I've ever put on Instagram is my wife's skiing. Your wife's well, what? Yeah, but like who would think right she's like doo, 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 doo. and she says like i'm kind of rude because i took her down you know a tough run and that's the most viewed thing that has ever been on our our social media so uh, i do think we can overexpose ourselves and and i think what you were talking about bruce doing it is probably the most effective way is that it, it's got to be more of a complete like like i'm a good human being people see me in the community as a good human being People vouch for me as a good human being, like the, the reviews, like you came to a city and you did it. And and if and when they actually need us, they find us online and intersect. So like you're top of mind, like it's it's got to be a combination of those things. I just don't have the time to do it. And that's why I've gone to like these companies thinking, oh, they're just going to solve all my problems. But they can't. Like I can tell you that like, like our firm moniker is like causes, not cases. And... For me, that has been like the most powerful marketing tool that we I've used. And the reason why is because it becomes less about like hire me because I'm a lawyer that can solve a problem and a get behind me because I'm plowing forward on a solution. Like I think that for people who are even in car accidents, like if you were to say, for example, like, hey, there's this pothole or this intersection where a lot of wrecks are happening. And you become the guy who is like, this intersection is dangerous. 
I'm going to be out here, and every time the 